Okay, thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, so let us quickly complete the revision so that we can take up the questions also. Okay. Okay. So first is like uh, why we need generic. The need is to have a structural polymorphism, right? So we need to understand what is a structural polymorphism means. So normally polymorphism is a single interface with different implementation. The idea is we use something called as a dynamic dispatcher. The rule of dynamic dispatcher is if I have a sorry, if I have a superclass type or a parent type. Uh, reference using that we can refer any child class object. So what we do, we take a general parent like a bank as a super class, and we can have different bank implementation which which is inheriting that particular bank class, right? So what can happen if I create a reference of bank type using that I can call implementation belongs to any bank. That's the idea is. So it remains the call, the interface, the function name as exactly the same but depends on which object it is referring to the implementation gets changed so that's how the polymorphism is implemented through dynamic dispatch right so the idea behind this term the structural polymorphism that we want to implement certain behaviors for a group of the classes depending on their common capabilities so if I define a parent class or a super class like a bank, which is having the capabilities like a, a bank can give a capability to do a deposit, do a, a withdrawal, do a balance check. So any bank you are creating actually from the actual bank class, the parent bank class, that should implement all those deposit, then a withdrawal, then a check balance, this kind of capabilities. So using that, I can create common behavior for my group of the classes. So for example, if you look at this, if I want to have search facility for all the classes, right? So I need to look for the object which is having the capability to check, check equality. If I can check the equality between uh, two objects like O1 and O2, then I can write a search function for all these kinds of objects, right? So since it is this facility there for string, integer, double, float. So for all of them, I can implement a search function. So for the classes also, if I want to enable the search function, what I need to do, I need to implement something called as a equals method, right? So if you have this uh, equal methods implemented, that makes you capable to have the search method. So that says whenever you are inheriting or implementing a class, or an interface which gives you the capability of equals, then your object also becomes uh, enabled for using any kind of search behavior. Right. Similarly, if some set of objects having the compare capability, so if I create a class and makes it implements that uh, comparable. Uh, interface. So I have the compare to methods I need to implement it. That means using my class object, I can definitely do a shorting. So any class rather do implement that particular comparable uh, interface, they will get the same facility. That's the idea. Is so it gives you a way to write a common behavior or common function. For different data types who which are having the same kind of capabilities. So if my integer float double employee student all inherits the comparable, so for all these classes I can implement a short function. If my employee student integer float double for which I can have the equals method is implemented, then for all of them I can have a searching method enabled, right? Now, what is the problem? The limitation is only that whenever I'm having a class and I'm inheriting the class or implementing the interface between a number of objects, 
so what will happen the capability of this class or interface will be shared between them so for all these classes i can design certain behavior or a certain method so that will be applicable for all these classes which are inheriting a common super class or a interface but how do i generalize like my function will be applicable for all the objects in the java class hierarchy that is possible if i use something that's the object class because as you know the object class is at the top of any class of java class hierarchy so if i use the capability of the object class that means whatever the behavior i'm implementing it is have implemented for all the classes belongs to the java class hierarchy so that's the idea if i want to create a generic function uh, a method which is generalized for all kinds of object will make them as an object class type so they i want to say if i can pass here integer float double or employee or a student because they share the same capability of the object class that's all so if i want to write a find method or a search method the simple way i should see for my object this functionality is there that's all so as you go for any class you write your any class that's by default inherited the object class so any class by default having this equals capability which is implemented like a equals function right similarly if you want to implement the sort facility so you need to go for the compare or comparable that kind of int, uh, that kind of facility so if you do go for those things you will have the sort kind of methods implemented for your object but what is the problem to use object as a general type so why we don't call it as a generic program because there are certain restriction to have a object over here so what are this problem first problem is called as a type inconsistency right what is type inconsistency so whenever i'm writing a statement like this please please look at this statement this is a very important statement right so this means what is happening this srci is basically is a object which is there in your heap memory which will be pointed by or are referred by a reference which is of type target type now as per the rule of dynamic method dispatcher this target type must be a super or same type of the source right it cannot be a sub type of the source right because as per the rule of dynamic method dispatcher a reference can refer to its own type or a sub class type so this should be its own class or it should be a uh, its own object or a sub type object or sub class object right so that means whenever we are doing it so if i write a generic program using my objects so what will happen here what will happen here this is also an object and this is also an object so my compiler cannot detect the error right my compiler cannot detect the error but it may happen that your src1 is an object right it is a type of object but it is pointing to a object over here that's a class a type and the target reference which is also an object type that is pointing here to a b type now if a and b types are the same types this works right if b is a parent type of a b is a parent type of a means this is the parent and this is the child this also works but what if a is a parent type of b right a is a parent type of b so in that case this is a this is b 
so as per the rule of dynamic method dispatcher a subclass reference cannot refer to a superclass object right so runtime will throw an exception but compiler cannot detect it because for compiler both are object at the runtime we can only find out which object it is pointing to and the moment it will find out the object of target i is basically as a subclass or a subtype of super uh, source everything is gone runtime will get a exception and your type safety is fully compromised because this type safety checking cannot be done by the compiler you will get it only on the runtime that's the big problem okay so next how can i design the generic arrays or list or a data structure which can have multiple uh, elements which can be of different type right so one idea is to use the object because object if you are creating a array of the object type object type array so is supposed to pass a list of integer list of string list of uh, double list of employee anything into it right because object is a super class and super class can refer to a child class object but this is also having certain problems that think about whenever you do an assignment array of i equal to st and st is a student type so there will be a type casting similarly whenever you are retrieving the value so what you need to do you need to get the array i that value into st you have to get back the value and this is now is a explicit casting because you know if a, if a child is casted to the parent type then it is a implicit casting but if parent is casted to a child type then it is a explicit casting so every time you want to do a operation if you want to put it inside your array you need to first make it convert it from a student to an object then put it into an array but whenever you want to access your student from the array you need to get back your object convert it into a student then get the functionality of the student so you need yeah yes, sir can you repeat the implicit casting and explicit casting okay please yeah just give me a moment and i'll erase this this is a bit clutter So the simple way the idea is, uh, the casting idea is if you have a, b, right? So b inherits a. The simple idea is if you have a equal to b, where is uh, this is b, right? So this is a child type, a subtype casted to the parent type. So this is a implicit, right? But if you have this. this doesn't work is a implicit casting parent to child doesn't work like this it has to be a explicit casting it has to be done like this now what i mean to say what is difficulty to have a parent type array so the idea is now the idea is now object is on the top of my java class hierarchy so if i am creating a student class that by default inherits the object class right so if i create an array of object class type right i just create an array and whatever the new and all i'm not writing now if i want to have a student object say t i have created it now can i write arr of i equal to t it is absolutely fine because this is a parent type this is a child type a parent type can refer to a child object and this is implicit because child is getting casted to a parent type but you have to understand there is a implicit casting is happening because a student is converted into a object then it is stored into the array similarly suppose student having a feature roll number you want to access the roll number so i want to access the roll number which is belongs to or student having a particular functionality uh, that's that's more relevant say so they want study and a student want to study 
but uh, your generic class say this then you need to get your object on the ith position so i want to check out how this ith student study right and i have to get it into my object t but now it is a parent type getting casted to a child type this is the explicit casting right this casting has to happen otherwise the student will be called from what object class not from the student class you have to say you are casting it to a student type then then only the study will be called from the student otherwise it will be called from the parent type right so that's what i'm saying whenever you are storing the student is getting implicitly casted into a object and whenever you are retrieving or accessing your object is getting casted into a student and that is a explicit casting so number of type casting is happening right so during the casting some information may be also lost the second problem is homogeneity could be also lost so i want to create a generic i want to create a array so array of integers it takes a number of integers i want to create a student array all our students but whenever i'm creating a object array so what about if i say the first element of my array is a new student type the second is a uh, second is a 10 the third is a float because all are objects these are all possible right so i'm basically creating a heterogeneous array and the problem of heterogeneous array once they are casted to an object they are all object i do not know what type they are so homogeneity of the array could be also lost so how you can ensure this uh, homogeneity then how you can ensure this casting could be avoided unnecessary casting then type consistency can be ensured the way is to use generics so you can use a generic kind of data structure like this you pass a t so depends on how you instantiate your t if you say it's a integer your data structure will be created for the integer and it's a homogeneous it takes only integers if you instantiate with a double your data structure is for double it takes all the elements which are of double type right so this is a function which takes a t type return a t type so it's also consistent in the sense it's if it is taking a integer as an input it gives the integer as a output so that consistency you can ensure if you are giving it as a double as a input your output is also double then this kind of consistency which avoid this problem what we have discussed here that target assigned to so we want to ensure that the source could be of the same type of the target or it's a child type of the target right so how do i do it i defined i defined this source extend t so source extend t means either it is of type t so this is s type this is t type so either it is of t type or s is a sub type of t right so that makes this confirm this copy will be all, uh, also this uh, assignment could be also checked in the compile time so that at the run time we never get a exception that failure never happen so this is just an example how do i write a generic data structure or implement a structural polymorphism so i want to create a generic type of linked list so i mention t so t could take a integer float double or it's a student or a employee or anything else right so since the information of t type since the information is of t type what do we do we create a node which will keep information that's a t type data right that's a t type information so whenever you want to access head what is the information at the head position it returns a t type value so if it is a integer linked list it returns you integer stored as integers if it is a double kind of linked list it stores as integer returns you a integer sir one uh, yeah maybe a dumb question yeah please. so that uh, angle bracket t right is there a official name for it what do you call it quantifier or uh, this um the angle bracket is called quantifier no 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 quantifier is the definition angular 
bracket is it isn't it the type it's parameter? called type parameter yeah please please go on yeah i am saying that is it uh, uh, called type parameter yeah type parameter i just told that but t is the type parameter but i do not know this uh, bracket having some special name or i cannot remember actually the t is the type parameter and definition of the t is the quantifier but yeah it's pune i think but exactly this bracket is having some name i cannot remember i'll check out right but this t is definitely the type parameter okay so this is a caution like a problematic part of it see uh, that's basically a redefinition or requantification of your parameter type parameter see for your class you are defining a s now whenever you are defining a function here using quantifier this is quantifier you are defining your type parameters this is quantification so again you are defining s so you need to understand this s and this s are different they are not the same right so the way if i want my class s must use uh, the s whatever i'm passing so if it is integer i want this is also an integer then you have to remove this quantification again the definition again if you redefine it this s and this s will become different but if you don't give this quantification once again this means you are going to use the s which is passed over here if the my class is instantiated with s uh, integer then this is also an integer if it is string then it, this is also string but if you again do a quantification over here that means here if it is an integer that does not mean this has to be an integer because this becomes this depends on the quantification or sorry instantiation of the uh, type for my method right and in this case how will we write uh, my class because we, we want to uh, now put t as a type parameter right so can uh, i quantify yes and put my t? method this is defined for my method so uh, if i define a my class say i define it for my integer uh, say i say it's a i whatever new right if i want to call i dot my method then again i do have to do quantification i need to do double and whatever i want maybe a string then i'll pass whatever the value but if i don't do this quantification i just pass my method and whatever i'm passing it has to be an integer only because this has to match this is is it okay yeah i understand that i understand mm -hmm. but what if i want to quantify yes but put a type parameter t in the my method yeah you pass over here no using a comma s comma t right okay ah huh. s comma t here itself Okay, so I have to do it at the class level. I can't my my in. You can do it, but uh -huh. it becomes a different meaning. Like it's a redefinition of the parameter. Okay, I understand. Okay. Again, so, you have to instantiate them separately. That's the point. And sir, the second case is also possible where the S and T is not there, like uh, given there. Right? What is not there? It means uh, the S and T sir, in the I dot my method. Mm -hmm. and you have to directly put in yeah uh, that is if i don't quantify i can just call it like this and i need to ensure this matches the type i'm passing as a in the s and uh, not mentioning is also possible right as in t means here you are not mentioning in the angular bracket to the what should be the s and t like yeah i'm this. saying either you do the quantification for your class or do it for a method don't do for both because what will happen it becomes like a redefinition of s and t once again right that's what i'm saying if you do a definition of the class at the sorry definition of s at the class level and you want to use the same s for your method don't do again a quantification that's all
okay so if you are defining your s at the class level and again if you define for your function that means that class level s and your method level s are different right but if you your method want to use the same type s which you have defined on the class level so you will do it only on the class level that's all okay yeah this this line is important say quantifier s and t in the my method will marks the type parameter s it will overwrite it got the method my method okay now we go for a very uh, complicated topic of subtyping right so the idea is so these are the example you can just uh, go through afterwards like uh, 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 normal thing is idea is if you have a number and which is inherited by an integer so idea is if you have a integer i equal to new whatever integer then you can have this number n equal to i that's always possible right because this is a parent type which can refer to a child object but what is not possible what is not possible that if you take this uh, number here write it as a n and if you have a list which takes a integer i define then n equal to i that's not possible right why it's not possible so normal types like for integer and number we say them as an compatible type or they called covariants they are covariant since they are compatible the cast type casting between these two are possible but none of the generics are covariants or type castable until and unless explicitly say you say like you are having a t and x extends t until and unless you define t and s explicitly like this none of your generics are generic types are type castable so that's how it is shown over here even if you are having a string and the object type takes everything this is not a compatible type and as i have shown this uh, you cannot make a list of uh, number coherent uh, uh, covariant with a list of uh, integer although these two are compatible or a covariant type so why this is happens you need to understand for that the type eraser so type eraser is a portion of Uh, java compiler itself so whenever uh, the you write a source code in java which is having some kind of generic code it convert it into a byte code and at the end of conversion to the byte code whenever it generating the byte code what it do whenever it finds a generic type it convert it to a object type or a upper bound type so in general just think about every generic is con converted into an object you have to understand this also becomes an object this also becomes an object and any a b c d uh of list that also becomes a object so how do you decide which is compatible with which because everything we get it as an object and the run time in run time the compatibility never could be checked for the generic type that's the problem because every generic will become a object type and if you look in a way all the object types are compatible so if you have a integer and a student a list of integers and list of student after compilation both becomes object but they are actually not compatible types right so that's why java restrict any compatibility between any generic types so none of the generic types are compatible or they are covariant until and unless you explicitly write the extend or something now how you can overcome because uh, suppose yeah, i think you have done this kind of program in uh, in your uh, 
programming assignments and many places because this is the most important kind of program we do in generics so we'll have some kind of print list or some other kind of function like get the sum of all the elements of the list get printed all the elements of the list or find out the maximum element for the list and we pass a pass a list or a set the idea is i can pass a list of students i can pass a list of integer i can pass a list of floats i can pass a list of elements for each my function will work but the problem is here if i am having a list of string can i call it with a l now l is which type l is list of string type and as we have seen any generic types are not compatible any two generic types are not compatible so linked list of string and linked list of object although object and string they are compatible they are castable but these two are not castable right even if you have a linked list of integers will find they are not castable linked list of student they are not castable it takes only the input that is of linked list of object exact match so what could be my solution the one solution is use a quantifier over here define a t and t and since you make the call this t is a generic type so t will take the shape of string now and it is callable because t will be becoming a string if i even call it with a linked list of integer it's a i and uh, i call it as a print list of i even this call is possible the t will become a so that's the idea of uh, generic like generic type t it can take any type parameter but object cannot do that right object or any type cannot do that okay so here also comes the concept of wild card see you have quantified the t t is the new type which you are defining so if it is a integer t will become a integer if it is a string it becomes a string but what inside your function if you are just writing a system dot out print l and then you are printing the list of i you give a for loop or something and you are just printing it so thus do you use this t in any manner so this t is defined but it is not going to be used in your function right it may be used depends on how you are writing it but there could be a many cases where i don't want to use this t if i want to print the list why i need this definition of t so in that cases what i can go for i can go for just a wild card so i don't have to define a t right i'll just make a parameter like this i'll say this uh, public static void then a print list and i'll make it as a linked list of question mark done because this t i'm not going to use my inside my function so why to define it so this t means it will take any type so any type means it can take i can pass a string i can pass an integer i can pass anything which is given right so the terms here the question mark is called a bounded wild card uh, sorry sorry so this is a unbounded, the unbounded wild card yeah you yeah, make the correction i'll make the correction it is a unbounded correct uh, card so this will the type eraser for it will be object type for bounded wild card it will be this extend or super means uh, in this case of extend the upper limit is t so that means you can pass any object which is of type t or subclass of t in this case the lower limit is t so you can pass an object which is of type t or super class of t which is type of super type of t next the last topic from the generic the type eraser so type eraser what is we have already discussed that uh, the compiler 
at the at time of generating the byte code all the generics will get casted to if it is unbounded type it becomes a object if it is a bounded type it will be casted to the not casted it will be erased to the upper limit it will be replaced by the upper limit so simple way how does it happens if you have a t which is unbounded because a t could be anything right it becomes a object but if you have a extend so t could be mammals or any child type of mammals so it will be replaced by the upper limit that's the mammals please note this carefully right this is very very important question okay um one thing you have to remember for the generic type we cannot use the instance of but we can use the use the get class right so instance of will fail it gives a compiler error for the generic type but you can use the get class because the get class having a way it could explore inside the object and find out some metadata inside the object to uh, check out the metadata of the object to find out actually which object it belongs to and one more difference between instance of and get class get class will give you the exact type of the object whereas instance of give you the actual class along with the super class also right so if as is a type of string if you say as is a instance of a string it say true true if you even say as is a instance of object it also says true if you have a employee and a manager and manager in it's a employee and you are having manager m if you ask m is a instance of manager it says true if you say m is a instance of a employee it also says true but in case of get class it gives you the exact type it will always say it's a manager right the problem obviously you can understand in case of instance everything convert sorry in in the, in case of generic everything converted into a object type so instance of cannot find out the class hierarchy which is applied for that particular object but get class as is has to detect only the exact class for the instance it can find out it from the metadata so instance of doesn't work for the generic but get class works okay overloading is a complex thing which should not be done for a generic type although it is legal for non generic type so you can definitely have a my method for integer my method for mammals integer and mammals are two different types so it is overloaded but this is not possible array list of integer array list of mammals because if you convert it both will become object both the parameter this becomes object this becomes also object so both the functions both the uh, methods takes the object type only so this is not overloading right the parameters must be of different type or number of parameters should be different but after type is a applied both becomes of object type okay so get class we have discussed one more is you cannot create an instance you cannot create an instance of an array type of a generic type this is also the same reason so t could be an integer float double but actually what will happen inside your runtime environment your array will be actually created of object type because all the specific type t information will be lost during the runtime so if you write a integer array if you write a double array but at the runtime it actually creates a object array it cannot keep the actual type information so there is no point to have an instance of an array which ultimately is going to create an object array inside right so that's why it basically gives you a compiler error so please check like where you can go wrong so those are basically get uh, given in a red color so these are few highlights are met so that's all for the generic right so i think uh, next uh, nalini you are you will go no no sir like no sir me oh dhaniya ma'am okay okay sorry sorry reflection do you want to say reflection
reflection i'll take it along with the bk yeah okay then anand sir should take sir. okay okay so please keep your questions uh, we'll take it after uh, the revision is done okay so just a time check uh, so we are doing a, actually a, is, is doing a, is quite useful but would we go beyond 6 o'clock also if needed yeah it's okay okay thank you okay arun sir shall i come yeah yeah please yeah. okay so now i'm going to discuss about uh, week 6 content So in week six, uh, the first topic is indirection. Okay, how we can apply indirection to the to concrete implementation using interface. Okay, first suppose here we have two concrete implementations. First one is circular array queue and a linked list queue. Okay, so these two are the two concrete implementation classes. Okay, so these two has same set of methods. but the internal implementation is different okay so here for adding okay an elements to the circular array queue okay add method add method is there remove method is there uh, to remove an element from circular array queue and uh, to get the size of okay how many number of elements we have in the circular array queue you can get it by using size method okay so here name of method is same but the internal implementation is different in circular array queue and the linked list queue okay so in in between these two classes i want to apply the indirection how we can apply the indirection by using an interface okay now first suppose i want to okay so call these methods add method remove method size method okay from uh, circular array queue as per well, linked list queue so in order to call these methods so we need to create objects okay so here what i am doing is so without applying indirection so here what i am doing is i am going to take one reference variable circular array queue okay e and here caq okay caq this is the reference variable of circular array queue okay i written in sharp okay so here linked list queue l l q of e okay sorry uh, e so here l l q okay l l q now here this c a q and l l q now what i am doing is this c a q is capable of holding only circular array q okay circular array q object like this okay circular array q object like this okay so i am not able to store okay i am not able to store other than okay this circular array q object in this reference variable caq and here also okay so llq so llq is a reference variable of the linked list queue okay now i am i am able to okay instantiate this reference variable llq with llq is equal to new okay new linked list queue of e. like this okay i am not able to okay initialize other than llq okay so here llq is a reference variable of linked list queue now, now i am able to initialize this llq with the okay new llq okay for suppose i want to okay right instead of llq i want to write caq here in second statement here okay in this line i want to replace this llq with caq is it possible it is not possible because these are incompatible okay and here at caq is equal to new caq okay so here i am not able to i am not able to replace this caq with llq because these are not compatible okay now what i am doing is i am applying indirection between these two concrete implementations by using an interface so here uh, i'm going to take one interface with the name q okay with the name q 
now these two concrete implementations okay are implemented from okay i'm forcing to implement these two classes from few interface okay so these here methods are implemented so we have implemented methods okay. so here implemented methods from few interface here and here okay we have the concrete implementations of these methods in circular array as well linked list now what i'm doing is in order to call this add remove size methods okay now i need to create an object for okay circular array as well linked list okay so now what i'm doing is okay so in previous example sorry in previous slide okay i require two variables okay i require two variables but instead of that okay now what i'm doing is i'm going to take only one reference variable q q here q is a reference variable of okay q interface okay now i can instantiate this q with new okay circular array q of sorry of e as well q is equal to new okay l l q okay linked list q of e. okay like this because here q is an interface okay so this is implemented in okay both circular array q as well linked list q so whatever the class okay implemented from q interface okay so q interface now we can assign that class object to this reference variable okay so now q okay q is reference variable of q interface now we can instantiate this reference variable okay we can instantiate this reference variable with any of its implemented class object okay any of its implemented class object so these two are the implemented classes of the q interface now this q can be initialized with okay it's a implemented classes okay caq and linked list q okay so here i am applying in direction between these two classes by using q interface now this q interface okay reference variable is capable of holding okay so any of its implemented class object okay so this is uh, in direction very okay simple topic and uh, i'm moving to next topic java collections if you have any specific doubt you can interrupt me okay okay now i'm moving to java collections okay so here what is collections framework okay so here collections framework is nothing but okay it is a collection of okay interfaces and classes okay so here by using collections okay we can organize group of heterogeneous objects efficiently okay so here in collections okay we can store okay heterogeneous data means we can store integer integer type of data flow type of data or uh, any type of data string data okay so we can store any type of data okay we can organize organizing is nothing but here we can add the elements and we can remove the elements we can update the elements we can delete the elements okay so we can okay organize a group of heterogeneous objects efficiently okay by using collections framework okay so in order to store okay in order to delete okay in order to update the elements we have okay predefined collection classes okay here we no need to worry about the internal implementation okay just we have to know what are the okay predefined methods available in the collection classes okay what are the predefined methods available in the collection classes and how to play with the methods okay so we should concentrate on okay what are the predefined methods available okay in the collection class and how to play with that methods okay we no need to okay think about how it is implemented in that okay so here okay next so here we have several okay interfaces and classes okay so those are okay rendered in this picture so here collection is the top level interface and here list okay q 
and set. These three are the interfaces inherited from collection interface. Okay. So here list set. Okay. List set. These two are has small difference. Okay. So here list interface allows duplicates. Okay. So it allows duplicates and the set interface does not allow the duplicates. Okay. Duplicates are okay not allowed in the set interface okay and list interface is ordered okay ordered okay so are indexed we can also call indexed okay so if you okay add an element to the list interface or sorry here list interface means here whatever the classes implemented by the list interface here array list link list vector and stack so these are these are the four classes implemented from list interface now these four classes allow the duplicate values and these four classes follow the index okay so these are ordered collections for suppose if you add an element to the array list okay it will add at the zeroth index and if you add one more element so it will add at the first index okay second index like that okay it will follow the okay insertion order but set interface does not follow the okay insertion order okay so these are not indexed okay these are not unordered okay not indexed in the unordered okay so these are the implementation classes of the okay set interface okay has set linked has set and array set okay now coming to the queue okay so queue interface implemented classes are two priority queue and array queue okay so we'll discuss one by one uh, these classes okay in next slides okay so map is different from these three uh, okay interfaces so map will store the values in the form of key and the value pairs okay so key value like this okay so map interface okay whatever the classes implemented from okay map interface those classes store the values okay in the form of key and the value pairs okay so now let me discuss about but tree set has order no yeah tree set has order so here internally it will sort the elements so not only tree set we have sorry sorry you are talking about this tree set no okay okay yes tree set will sort the elements in uh, sorted order no? so internally but it will not follow the user insertion order yeah and okay, then yeah. order is by default uh, descending that was the mock quiz question order is descending ah okay okay so internally it will sort the elements like the descending or ascending default ascending yeah default ascending, ascending. sorry Ascending yeah. for both cases, tree set and tree map. Yeah, but here it will sort the elements based on the key, not uh, based on the value. No, no, I am saying if key is the integer value component, <coughs> then by default it is ascending order, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, list interface. So already said no. So list interface is a ordered collection of objects okay so here we can get an element from okay list by using its index okay because it follow the user insertion order okay we can predict the order of and uh, order of elements in the list interface okay so it will store already i said no so 0 1 2 3 like this it will follow the okay so order okay and the list can have duplicate elements okay you can add Okay, duplicate element in the list any number of times. Okay, based on your requirement. Okay, so here, see, so these are some possible methods in list interface. Okay, first one is add method. Okay, second one is remove method and get method and set method. Okay, so see here, first one is add method. So add method is overloaded method. So add of element directly, you can add element like this so it will add an element to the end of the list okay here if you want to add okay an element at the specific index okay specific index you can add it 
okay and here set is also there okay so what set will do it will update the element but it will add the element at a particular index but it will update the elements at the particular index so this is the, uh, that is the difference between add and set okay at get so element uh, in set method if the corresponding index there is no value then it will uh, uh, means create the new element as a value i think it will generate an exception because if there is no element at this index definitely it will uh, out of throw index exception yeah out of index. okay yeah here you can remove an element from the list okay by using its index and you can get an element from the list by using its index okay so these are some possible methods we have in list interface and uh, list interface implemented classes array list and a linked list okay see here so here array list and a linked list so here add method okay to add elements to the list like this okay so here add, add method we add an element to the list at the end okay see here first there is no elements in the list so if you add an element to the list it will add okay it, this is the first element and if you add an element to the list again like this it will add after level okay it will add an element at the end of the list okay next see here add of 3 comma 5 means what happened whatever the element okay whatever the element you have at the index 3 okay that is moved to 4 fourth index because you are adding okay an element okay at the particular index okay now whatever the element at the index 3 actually see here 0 1 2 3 okay now in this third position okay 55 will be inserted now this fourth uh, this uh, five element is there no this is shifted to the fourth position for suppose if you use set method okay instead of set, uh, add method if you use set method what happen this uh, 5.0 is replaced with 55.0 okay it will update set method but here add method will add at the particular index okay next here we have contains method so contains method is used to check whether okay given element is present in the list or not okay so it will return true either true or false if element is there it will return true otherwise it will, it will return false okay next index of method will return index of a given element okay index of a given element if element is there it will return its uh, index otherwise it will, it will return minus okay next list one dot remove of 23 of 0 so here what i am doing is here i am removing an element from the list by using its value directly you can give the object whatever the object you want to delete from the list or otherwise you can give the index also based on the index you can remove an element from the list and based on the object also you can do okay next see here list dot get of 7 okay here you can get an element from the list by using its index and size method will return size of the list okay how many number of elements we have in the list and sub list will return the sub list okay based on the given index values okay and sort method will sort the elements okay in ascending order by default okay by using collections dot sort it will sort the elements in ascending order so these are the possible methods uh, okay we have in list interface and array list linked list both are okay same but here the internal implementation is different okay so you can use same methods see there is no difference so whatever the methods okay i implemented on this array list okay same set of methods i implemented in linked list okay so here linked list internally use the doubly linked list data structure here array list will use internally array to store the elements okay so here you no need to okay you no need to worry about the internal implementation okay so here array list will use the okay array as internal implementation and 
linked list will use doubly linked list data structure internally to implement the linked list okay and both are index based only okay both are index based only and whatever the methods okay you applied on array list you can also apply on linked list also okay now i am moving to set see set interface okay so here set interface okay it does not allow the duplicates and we cannot predict the insertion order okay we cannot predict the insertion order see here these are the three implementation class of the set interface okay hash set okay linked hash set and tree set okay so here in tree set we cannot guarantee the order of the elements okay we cannot guarantee the order of the elements in hash set but in linked hash set so whatever the okay order user inserted okay it will, it will follow the okay user insertion order okay even it follows the user insertion order okay you cannot get an element from the linked linked hash set okay linked hash set using its index okay because it will not follow the okay index internally okay so whatever the classes okay implemented from set interface okay those classes not follow the okay those are not okay those are unordered okay not follow the index internally okay so here has set okay we cannot predict the order of the elements in has set in linked has set okay we can predict the order okay so in whatever the order okay you inserted elements into the linked has set it, it will follow the okay same order okay next three set okay so internally it will okay sort the elements in ascending order okay so this is uh, and what is the common functionality in these three classes is okay three classes okay does not allow the duplicates so that is the common functionality in all the classes this set classes okay here it will not follow the does not guarantee the order okay it will guarantee the order okay guarantee the order means you cannot okay get an element from the linked hash set using its index but if we can predict the order okay but we cannot get an element from the linked hash set based on its index even you can predict the order okay in tree set okay internally it will sort the elements in ascending order okay so this uh, this is the difference between okay hash set linked hash set and tree set okay only the common functionality between okay these three classes is okay so these three classes are, does not allow the duplicates okay so if you have any specific doubt you can ask it otherwise i will move to the next So next one, uh, queue interface. Okay. So already we know. Okay. So queue about queue data structure. So so queue data structure. Okay. We have friend and rare. Okay. So you can insert an element into the queue. Okay. From rare. Okay. So rare insert and friend delete. Okay. Rare insert and friend delete. Okay. So this is a uh, the queue data structure okay so fifo already you know about fifo no first in first out order it will follow the first in first out order okay so whatever the element you inserted first that is going to delete it first okay so you can insert an element into the queue data structure okay from rare and you can delete an element okay from the queue data structure from friend okay you can also called head and tail okay so here Q data structure, okay. Q data structure is implemented, okay, in two classes. First one is priority queue, and second one is array deck, okay, array deck. So priority queue, so you can insert, okay, an element from the, okay, rare only, okay. You can insert from the only one end, and you can, okay, remove an element from the priority queue from one end, okay. From both ends, both operations are not possible. 
okay in priority queue okay if you want to insert elements you should insert from the rare only from tail and if you want to remove an element okay from the priority queue okay you should get it from the front only okay but here priority queue okay internally assign some priority to the elements okay so whatever the okay element okay whatever the smallest element in the priority queue that gets highest priority for suppose see here i inserted 10 first okay 2 next 1 and 25 okay 6 okay so this is the first element i inserted in that okay so first okay highest priority is 10 because only one element in the okay queue next i inserted 2 now what happened so this is the smallest element okay so now this gets highest priority next i inserted 1 okay now among these three it has okay it is the lowest element smallest element now it, it will get highest priority okay after that you inserted 25 okay but highest priority remains okay to the one because here 25 okay 25 is the is not smallest element in the queue next to six six is also okay not smallest element among these elements okay now if you try to remove an element from the priority queue now first priority queue will remove this highest priority element from the queue okay next after removing one if you try to remove one more element now it it become two okay so priority queue will remove two because next highest priority is two okay now after two six after six ten after ten twenty five this is the priority okay in this priority we can get elements from the okay priority okay so you can insert from the okay tail and you can get element from the head okay so next array deck so array deck see here so array deck this is tail and this is head now so you can insert okay elements from the both ends and you can remove elements from the queue from both ends okay so this is array deck okay so array deck okay in array deck class you can insert elements from the both ends and you can remove elements from the both ends okay and there is no uh, internally it, it is not uh, follow uh, it, it will not uh, sorry give any priority to the elements okay so for suppose here 10 okay so just i'm calling uh, add method so add method so add up 10 so it is going to insert an element okay to the queue like this okay so from rare for suppose if you want to add an element okay from the head actually from head you can remove an element but i want to okay insert an element to the queue from the head okay from the head then we should use add first method okay add first method add first of 20 okay so if you call add of 20 okay if you call add of 20 what happened so by default okay q will add an element from the okay rare from the tail so if you call add method it will add here it will add here for suppose if you call add first then it will add an element to the queue from the head from the header here it will add okay so not here if you call add first method and if you call poll method so poll method will remove an element from the chip so poll of so if you call poll method okay if you call poll method it will look at the head of the queue okay head of the queue and it will remove and it will return it okay so now 20 will be written but so i don't want to remove an element from the head i want to remove an element okay an element from the tail actually from tail okay so we can insert but as this is array dq so i i can okay perform 
both operations from the both end now i want to remove an element from the tail then we should call whole last method okay whole last whole means by default it will remove an element from the okay q okay from the head but i want to remove an element from the tail then we should call whole last method then it will remove an element from the tail now then gets deleted so if you call whole okay so by default operation is from head it will remove if you want explicitly to remove an element from the tail then we should call whole last is it clear for everyone if you have any specific you can sir is there any method called remove last remove last uh, second so we'll check here okay so you got yeah we have remove last Oh, yeah remove last also we have okay so yeah and sir what's the difference between poll and peak method yeah peak will return okay it won't delete from the queue but poll will return and remove that's the difference okay it will peak will return and remove yeah yeah peak will just look at the head of the queue and it will return without removing it but poll will look at the head of the queue and it will return and remove from the queue okay got it and now last one map okay so already i said now so maps will store okay elements in the form of key and value pairs okay key and value pairs so here key and value pair okay these two are okay these two combination is an element okay an element in the okay map implemented okay classes okay so see here these three are the three implemented classes of the okay hash map sorry map interface okay so hash map tree map and linked hash map okay these three classes stores the elements okay in the form of key and the value pairs so here key should be unique and the value okay may be repeated okay may or may not okay so for suppose so student roll number so for suppose 101 okay 101 okay so ashu okay ashu and student roll number 102 so student name may be repeated no okay so two students okay two students with the same name okay maybe okay exist in the class but student with the same roll number okay should not be exist okay it it is not possible no so students may have same name in the class but students should not have same roll number okay so here key should be unique and the value okay may or may not repeat here yeah. okay so now what is the difference between okay so hash map tree map and linked hash map okay so what is the common functionality so all okay store the values in the form of key and the value pairs so that is the common functionality and what is the difference okay so in hash map so here hash map does not guarantee the order okay so does not guarantee the order of elements okay so we cannot predict the order here in hash map so linked hash map it will follow the user insertion order okay in which order we have inserted okay if we follow the same order okay we can predict the order in okay so linked hash map in tree map okay it will sort the elements internally in ascending order based no boys some 
statements internally. So only that is the map. Okay. Sir, could you explain the fractions one again? Once again. Hello. Yeah, Hello. You're audible. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I lost my connection. Yeah, you're audible. Okay, somebody asked you some doubt. Uh, can you repeat? Yes, sir. Refraction method. Can you explain once again? Reflections. Reflections. Yes. Differences you are asking. Which Hello? method? Sir, uh, reflection concept, sir. Reflection concept. Yes, sir. Okay. Reflection, we have so, not revised it. No, sir, sorry. Uh, yeah. The reflection topic in week five, right? That's what you're talking about. No? Big, sorry, big, I, uh, no, I am not sure. If, yeah. It is ma'am in week six, ma'am. First two. Reflection, yes, no? Yes, no, that is indirection. Oh, yes, 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 sir. Indirection. So what, yeah. what are you asking, Deepak? Are you asking for reflection or indirection? Um, I'm actually indirection, ma'am. Okay, okay. So I will go to that part after completion of this map, okay? Okay, sir. Ah, yeah. Okay. See here. So here, put method, okay? So you can add an element to the map, okay? Using put method, okay? So see here, put, okay. So here, this is key and this is value, okay. See here, here key type is string and the value type is double, okay. Value type is elements, okay. You can add any number of elements to the map, okay, using put method like this, okay. So next, see here, if you want to check whether given key is present in the Okay, map or not by using contains value. Sorry, a contains key method by using, okay, this contains key method, you can check whether given key is present in the, okay, map object or not. And you can also check whether particular element, sorry, particular value is present in the map object or not by using contains value. Okay, so contains value will check, okay, whether given value is present in the Okay, map object or not, and it contains key. We'll check whether given key is present in the map object or not. Okay, next here get method. Okay, so get method is used to get okay a value from the map object based on the given. Key. See here map dot get of x y z zero zero. Okay, so it will return its corresponding value. Okay, so its corresponding value is 67.9. Okay, 67.9. Okay, next map dot size means it will return how many number of key and value pairs in the map object. See here, one, two, three, four. Okay, totally we have four. Okay, four key and value pairs in the map object. Okay, so clear means it will clear. Okay, it will. Uh, uh, remove all elements uh, from the map object in a single chart like this. Okay. And you can check whether map object is empty or not. Okay. By using is empty method. And if you want to get, okay, key set means if you want to get only keys, all keys from the, okay, map object, then you should call keys method. Okay. So it will return the keys. Okay. Next, values method will return, okay, only values from the map object like this okay so these are some possible methods in okay possible methods in the map object okay so if you have any doubt uh specific doubt in this you can ask
Hello, am I audible? Hello? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, so key set is uh, the thing. And then why is the thing collection uh, when you get values? Why is it not a set? Here. Here uh, you are what? asking. Line yeah. number 21. Yeah. Why is this a collection and not a set? Uh, actually, here values method is predefined now. So predefined method. So so they given this uh, return type as collection. So that's why we should okay take it into collection only. And also and the values may have duplicates. Right, duplicate values. Yeah. Values okay maybe duplicate, but uh, here okay. keys should not be okay. Thanks. So, so yeah. okay, and then so entry set right. will give both value keys and values together. That will be a set. Yeah, entry set will return both. Okay. okay. So somebody asked uh, about uh, indirection. So yeah. See here. Here in indirection concept. Okay. So how we can okay. So provide indirection between two concrete implementations. Okay. See here, first suppose we have two concrete implementations. Okay. First one is circular array key and second one is linkalistic. Okay. So these two are the two concrete implementations. Okay. So here both are having same methods, but here the internal implementation is different. Okay. For circular array key and linkalistic key. Okay, so here add, remove, okay, size. Okay, these three are the methods okay, exist in circular array queue and linked list queue. Okay, now, okay, so in order to call these methods from circular array queue or linked list queue, okay, we require two reference variables like this in this case. Okay, here, here there is no indirection is applied in between, okay, so uh, in between these two classes. Okay. So here, this is reference variable of circular array queue, and this is reference variable of okay linked list queue. Okay, so LLQ and CAQ. Okay, now this CAQ, so we can instantiate this CAQ with which object only circular array queue object because okay this CAQ is a reference variable of okay circular array queue class. Okay, now LLQ. So LLQ is Reference variable of linked list queue. Okay, linked list queue. So now I can initialize this LLQ with okay linked list queue object. Okay, so if you want to assign okay, so instead of this LLQ, I want to write CAQ here. Is it possible? Is it possible here? No, sir. No, because this is incompatible. Okay, this is incompatible here also. So you cannot okay instantiate this CAQ with a okay CAQ with a LLQ. So if you have hundred okay hundred different implement uh, implementation class sorry uh, hundred concrete implementations like this okay you should require hundred what uh, reference variables like this okay hundred reference variables like this okay. So now what I'm doing is I'm applying indirection. Okay, between these two concrete implementations by adding an interface. Okay, here I'm going to take one interface. This is Q interface. I'm defining whatever the methods okay we are implementing in the circular array queue and the linked list queue as abstract methods in this okay Q interface. Okay, now I'm forcing these two concrete implementations okay to implement this Q interface. Okay, now this circular array queue, okay, and uh, this linked list queue, both are okay implemented. This add method, remove method, remove method, and size method, okay. So based on their internal implementation, they are going to implement this add, remove, and size methods in both the classes, okay, both the classes. Now in order to call this add, remove, size methods, okay, we should create object for circular array queue and a linked list queue, 
okay in previous okay in previous slide okay two reference variables are required okay in order to create objects for water two concrete implementations now in this case okay you no need required of two reference variables okay only one reference variable is enough okay that is q reference variable q okay now this q reference variable okay so we can instantiate this q reference variable with either circular array q or linked list q because these two are implemented from q interface okay q interface for suppose if you add one more okay concrete implementation here okay x y z q okay so that that is also implemented from q now you can also assign q is equal to x y z q like that okay here here okay applying indirection to the concrete implementations by using an interface like this is it clear hello yes yes sir okay sir is non value possible for key hello uh, is Where non value null value uh, uh, possible for key in uh, map sir okay uh, null value you are asking none sir hello. hello is is none value is possible uh, for key uh, can uh, can we use none value is, uh, in place of key yeah yeah in hash map and a linked hash map okay one null key is possible but tree map okay does not allow the null keys. okay so okay. in hash map and the linked hash map you can add one null key okay one null key is possible okay so you cannot add more than one null key. okay but in tree map okay you are not able to add null key. okay in tree map okay, you cannot add null value okay null value sorry null key is not allowed in tree map in hash map and the linked hash map okay one null key is possible okay you can add okay is it clear yes sir and here uh, see uh, in tree set also so you cannot add uh, okay null values okay through the tree set so if you try to add it will generate a exception okay at run time it will generate an exception and uh, in linked hash set and hash set you can add one null value only one null value Okay, so if you try to uh, try to add one more null value, already you know. So uh, set as it is set no, so set does not allow the duplicate value. So it will add uh, it allow only one null value. And coming to set, so you can add any number of null values. Okay, there is no okay constraint here. Okay, is it clear? Hello. Uh, yes sir then yaman uh, i have done okay thanks i'm okay. sharing it so yeah so we uh, we're going to revisit the concepts that were addressed in the week 7 uh, i hope i'm audible right yes ma'am yeah thanks okay so week seven in general was about you know handling errors and uh, debugging. Um, how do you uh, have you know how do you save diagnostic messages when uh, some errors are uh, generated and all that? So we'll just have a quick uh, a revisit of those topics. So first we uh, check how how are we dealing with errors in Java. So what are the type of errors that we generally encounter uh, when you are trying to you know write programs? So yeah, some examples are like with respect to user input, you have certain invalid file names or URLs, then certain limitations like, you know, uh, your memory is going out or even the disk full or even code uh, errors like uh, array index out of bounds and key not present in hash map or null, null point, I mean, null, you're encountering values which are null and division by zero. So these are the kind of 
errors that come into your program, right? And the programmer induced errors, right? So if you can actually foresee or kind of anticipate what is going to happen, we would rather uh, uh, you know signal the error than let the program crash. Because if you if we from the experience in programming, we see that if any of these errors come, right, which are which are like non-handled kind of exception, the program crashes and does not proceed. So we generally try to see how we can gracefully recover from these errors that occur when running the code. So in Java, everything, as you know, is you know either an object or something that comes from some class somewhere, right? So all the errors or exceptions and whatever, they descend from the class throwable. And the, the throwable class has actually two, uh, two branches. One is these errors and other is these exceptions. So errors are something that we categorize, which are not like a programmer's fault. It could be something which respect to uh, internal errors versus limitations. Uh, things which are like you know uh, beyond the programmer's control really so these uh, issues like we don't want to gracefully recover in fact we want to report and terminate it's not like you want to you know somehow say that okay some error occurred but i'm going to continue with the rest of the code you know in the case of errors you actually want to report and you want to terminate the program so rather than giving some message which is not uh, clear we actually have certain at, at different steps of the program can we say that this is what i want and if this does not happen certain i can actually give certain messages and uh, have a graceful exit so that is the one uh, one part of this throwable uh, class the other set is this exception where we anticipate okay these are the issues that are going to happen and if this happens what so under uh, so that actually we refer to as a exceptions and exceptions, we actually discussed that there are two main types of exception. One is the checked exception. The other is the unchecked exception. So checked means it is checked during the compile time. So these are the checked exceptions. So any exception which extends the main exception class, right? That is an exception. Unless, say, of course, if something ex ex extends that what is known as a runtime exception, it is also indirectly extending the exception class. What I mean by checked exceptions are those which are directly extending the exception class. Those exceptions which are extending the runtime exception, which in turn is a subclass of exception, right? The runtime exception is a subclass of exception. But if there are exceptions which are directly extending the runtime exception, these are unchecked exceptions. And these are not checked during the compile time. So generally, it is recommended that if you want to do if you want to declare some uh, exceptions, like we want to have user defined exceptions, it's normally checked exceptions, which we put it inside the dry catch. Unchecked exceptions are things like the array index out of bounds or arithmetic exceptions. These are like exceptions uh, which should have been caught by the code. So these are the two categories of exceptions which generally people have doubt about. So whenever you write a write a method, when you invoke a method which is known to throw a checked exception, then Java compiler will show you that this throws a checked exception, you have to put it inside the try catch block. So even when you're trying to code, you would have encountered many such instances. So those are the checked exceptions and the compiler will notify you something like, okay, this is such exception which has, which has to be put inside the try catch block and the other ones are like the unchecked exceptions. So if you put it something like, uh, a by zero or something, it will not, it possibly would not show because that's a runtime exception. So how do you handle these exceptions? How is Java actually handling these exceptions? So whatever is the code that you think that you anticipate is going to cause an exception, you put it inside what is known as a try block. Okay? So this is the try block, and you put the sorry, you put the um, uh, error prone code or the code which you are anticipating to um, generate some error, you will put it inside this. And then you can have multiple catch blocks, which means that you can, not, you can catch not just one type of exception, but many types of exceptions using a single uh, try block. Or rather, uh, as, a, as, a, as, what is, as a follow up to all, a try block, you can have multiple catch blocks, each of which can catch a different type of exception. So if you're going to have multiple exceptions and if you think like 
this exception is okay you may have a subclass superclass hierarchy of exceptions within the uh, these uh, catch blocks right then you have to order them like the super, subclass will be here and the superclass will be here in that order so if this is a subclass one which has a parent class then this will be the parent class and that is a parent class then that will be here something like that so it should be outward so whatever is a more specific should come on top otherwise what happens is if you put this catch on top of this one right sorry this catch which is like suppose this is only exception then that is a parent exception of all the exceptions right so if you put it in the first one that will catch everything and these catch blocks are basically um, not accessible because these catches are handled one after the other in the order in which they are written so this catch is first checked then this sorry this exception is first checked then this exception is checked then this is so you have to put the more specific exception on top so just to summarize it here so what you have to do is you have to enclose enclo enclose the code that may generate the exception in a try block i have already explained that code to handle the exception should be added in the catch block that is a catch block is the handling that has to have the handling mechanism for the error that you are expecting now if try encounters an exception rest of the code in the try block is skipped so if there are say five or six statements and the second statement inside the try block is generating the exception then the rest of the let's say three four five are not executed the control is transferred to the first catch block and if the uh, you know the exception does not match the exception which is given in the is a parameter of that catch it checks for a next catch and finally it goes to the final block right i'll come to that if exception matches the type in any of the catch blocks then the handler code executes handler code is nothing but what is there inside the catch block otherwise uncaught exception is passed back to the caller code so if none of the catch blocks are actually catching the exception which has been generated then the method which is which is actually which has this error prone code inside will throw the exception back to the caller method the method which is see for instance i have called a display method from inside inside the main method so i have a main method okay which calls a display method and this display method has okay some code say some try catch block is there okay right? but the exception is not handled here but still there is some code that generates an exception so this will throw the exception back to the main thread so here if you put it inside the try then it will catch it here. if this is also not there then the main you can actually say the main throws the exception okay so the caller method which is the caller method this is the main method which the the try catch block whatever is the unhandled exception here that will be thrown back to the main exception sorry main method that is the caller group that's what it meant by the column okay, okay. now uh, it is possible to catch more than one type of exception that i have already mentioned like with multiple catch blocks you can have and uh, catch exception type e catches any sub type of exception type. so if you put see the main exception right exception e say something like only the exception e inside the catch block this is enough to catch any exception that comes in but if you want to be more specific you want to give a very uh, custom message based on the specific type of exception then we give the uh, more specific exception type that is there inside the uh, more more specific exception that is expected for the uh, error code catch blocks are tried in sequence as i said it is the sequence in which it is specified in the code so first catch block is checked if it does not have the handle i mean if it does not have the proper exception that is generated goes to the next one next one next one etc again the order you have to order the catch blocks by argument type what is the argument the exception type right in the order more specific to less specific so the top most one will be the most specific and the parent class of in the next one and the further parent class and if you are have if none of these are having and you still want to catch it you can put it the catch this final sorry this one at the end okay so that is how the exceptions are called now throwing exceptions so now what we have been uh, saying is ca catching and handling exceptions right so how can you throw the exception so you want to write them 
Okay, this method throws two types of so a method, as you can see, can throw any number of exceptions, but at that time it throws only one exception, right? But inside there are many statements, say there is a division by zero, there is an IO exception that's expected, there is an array index bound. So any of these lines could have an exception. First time it encounters an exception, that exception is thrown. Now these are not thrown, right? So that's what I mean by one among many types of exceptions, right? So it, it is expected to throw, I mean, it, we are anticipating that it may throw an IO exception, it may throw an arithmetic exception, it may throw any type of exceptions and these are all declared. It declares all the exceptions that it is likely to throw as part of the method declaration. So public void my method throws all these exceptions, throws the exception using the throw statement. So inside the my, my method, right, inside this code, you have the throw statement and the syntax of the throw statement is the throws, it throws, it throws the exception using the throw statement that requires a single argument. So this is the single argument of the throw statement, which is a throwable object. Okay, so you are you just creating an object of the new empty stack exception. So that is uh, in a nutshell. So it can throw any subtype of the declared exception type. Right? So whatever is a declaration that you have given, right? Here you are giving that this is going to throw this, but you can throw a subtype of that exception. By calling such a method that throws an exception, the caller code must handle it. Okay, so that's what I said by like if you're expecting, say, in the, I think the core class method or something. I think this is this method definitely generate a class by font exception. Remember the exact one. Okay. So then this will necessarily you have to put it inside the try block, right? So that's what it means that like the caller code must handle. So if you're expecting that a method is going to um, generate an exception, you put it inside the try. That's what it meant that the caller code must handle. Or pass it such that the caller method also advertises. So if there is this method, say display method, and it is not going to put this inside the try block, then at least the display method should show that okay, it throws some method. So, so there is some method which is generating an exception. If you're not going to handle it, the calling method should actually throw that to the call method that calls this method. So ultimately it goes down to the main method, right? So it can actually get uh, what do you say and the right word that it actually get transferred from one uh, method to the parent method that is calling it and then the call so not parent method calling method calls it further if it is not called there it further gets propagated to the uh, calling method and so on so finally at some point you know this method and if it is not caught even in the method it will be thrown during when the program is done a customized ex uh, exceptions is define a new class extending exception to create a checked exception. So I've already explained. So if you extend this class, right, this is the way you create a checked exception. So un unchecked exceptions are using the runtime ex ex extending the runtime exception class, whereas the checked exceptions are created using by extending the uh, exception class. Now is the finally block. So uh, Every time we run the try catch, right? So we are, you are kind of anticipating some issue, and it's possible that you have uh, open, left certain resources open, something like a file, or I mean, you want you want to clean up some memory or something like this. So these cleanup operations are generally done inside the finally block. So whatever might happen here, whatever might happen here, finally block will still be executed, except when there is a system failure. That is, JVM itself shutdowns, then it doesn't know what to do, right? Except in such a scenario. It's always a finally block will definitely get executed irrespective of how many catch statements are there, how many try statements are there. Sorry, not try statement, how many catch statements are there, how many, what kind of exception was generated doesn't matter. The finally code will get generated irrespective of any of these uh, conditions, except when there's a system failure when the JVM in itself doesn't know what to do. So that is the uh, so finally is actually meant as a clean input, so don't uh, Confuse yourself what happens if there is an exception here, what if then so many things will be. I mean, so the whole idea finally is to do a cleanup after the um, after an exception is encountered or even otherwise. Now the lecture three is on packages. So this is something slightly different from you know whatever are there in the rest of the rest of the contents of the week. So packages, as we said, like you know, these are uh these are actually in you know, or these correspond to the folders, right? And so if you have a, a folder structure like this, right, in which you have a, another folder, and which you have another folder, say, uh, 
So this is Java. This is util. This is something stream. So in Java, you will write it as Java dot util dot stream dot something. Right? So this is how you write the import statement. This actually, this Java corresponds to parent folder. Util corresponds to one folder inside Java. Stream corresponds to another folder inside Java. So you can have custom packages. Right? You can have some, say your own. Straight. So you have you can have your own package say com, and I want to create something on arrays, and then I want something like this, right? You can have then I put it as com dot. Array. So don't use these keywords. I'm just uh, demonstrating. Just show that you know, you can have nested folders inside your. Uh, machine inside the operating system, whatever you have the directory structure, right? When you have these nested folders, these correspond to the, um, the these the uh, package structure here, okay? Now, what is this, um, how does it help us in identifying the access modifier, sorry, how, how does it help us in ensuring the access within the package? So within a package, there is a separate access, uh, um, what is access key which exists? So for instance, when I say private, private is only within the same class. Public is like for any class that tries to access. Package access is default access, right? Default access, when we simply declare a class employee, right? So this is a default access. So default access is like access, public access within that package. That is the, see the default visibility is public within the package. So if I don't give private or public or anything here, this, is, this means that this is a default access. And default access means that within the package, so if I have a code here, within this package, this access is public. That is the, um, yeah, that is the idea of the default visibility. Okay? Idea about the whole package itself. So wherever you don't see any uh, access specifier for a class or a method or whatever, it is a default access. And it means that within the package, these are accessible. This applies to methods as well as variables. And we can also restrict visibility with respect to inheritance hierarchy. Protected means visible within all the subclasses. So you have public, okay, protected, default, and private. These are the access specifiers. So default is within the package, protected is for all the subclasses, public is for all, and private is only within the class. So this is about the packages. You can just uh, go through all the questions in the assignment and to get a more, uh, to get a better idea about you know, how. So if you want to say, you have some uh, class inside this, which you want to invoke, and you are say here inside, which is like another folder inside. So this is another say list folder. Okay, so if you want to access some method inside this, then you have to something like form dot arrays dot. This is how you import that. Class inside. So, in, you, if you are inside the class list, so inside the package list, there is a class file which is inside the package list, and you want to access the arrays, then you put the full path com dot arrays, and then you will be able to access something inside this. Okay. So, this is the package access. Now, is the assertions. So, assertions like uh, initially when we talked about the errors, right? We said that okay throwable has errors and exceptions, right? So this is one such error that we are seeing. So assertion error is something that we want to uh, insist that, okay, I do not want to proceed if I encounter this kind of an error. So that is the assertion. I want to assert that a certain thing is what I'm going to, uh, what the programmer wants to insist on. So for instance, you want to insist that this has to be a non-negative integer, right? Or non-negative double value then I insist that this has to be at least zero. So that is preceded by this keyword assert. And this means that if this is not true, then it throws an assertion error. At some point, x becomes negative, then this throws an assertion error. Assert if it throws assertion error, then the program stops executing and it does not proceed anymore. But uh, the more important thing that, uh, just one second. Yeah, okay. So this is more for, uh, so you in generally when you uh, run a Java code, right, when you are given some Java software developed by some uh, programmer, you will not see these assertion errors because these are actually 
embedded inside the code in such a way that this can be this will be invoked. These errors will be invoked only if uh, we enable a certain thing during runtime. So that is a Java prompt. I'll just show you how to do that. So this is not meant to uh, meant as a information for the user of the program. This is more for the programmers. It's something like a diagnostic information that the programmer can use to say, okay, I'm getting this value. It's negative at some point. So or other users at the user reports that, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not getting the value that I want to get or some problem is it. Then we'll say that, okay, why don't you try running this code using the Java uh, with the enable assertions and then tell me what the message you're getting, right? So that also something uh, we, the programmer can just ask a, a user to run the code. I mean, there is a provision for that. They can just get the uh, um, error messages and uh, do some kind of a diagnosis, uh, even from a, uh, even from a, a remote uh, location, right? Okay. So yeah, so this is just, I'm just asserting if this is not satisfied, I get the assertion error, but in not just the assertion error, I also want to print something, then I can give like, I followed by a colon, whatever I give, to print. if I want to put, print a custom string, I'll put it inside the custom string. Here I'm just printing the value of x. So if you need to flag the error and take corrective action, then we have to use exceptions. So this is meant only for the cases where this is for fatal and unrecoverable errors. If you want to exit from it by taking some corrective action, then we must use the exceptions. So where the errors and where the exceptions are coming, so this is where the differentiation is. You want to actually see the ensure that this does not have a negative value. And if it gets a negative value, you want to come out of it, then you use the errors. So this is generally turned on only during development and testing, not checked at runtime after deployment. So one important thing about assertions is assertions are enabled or disabled at runtime only. And here, as you can see, on the uh, the this prompt direct the OS prompt, right? you write the Java minus A and the so this is how you enable the session. So you can write the full thing. You can write um, enable assertions also, or you can use the abbreviation minus E. That means that I'm going to enable the assertions for this uh, dot uh, class file of mine. This is my my code dot class, right? This is my program, and I, I'm I'm going to run this code. And if there is an error inside this, I'm going to see the assertions enabled. Assertions enabled for this. Now, there are many ways to selectively turn on and off the assertions. So I want to, so my code has a number of classes and I want to enable the assertions only for this class. Then I use this syntax, right? My, if I put minus EA, my class, my code, then, yeah, my class, then there will be my class one, my class two or whatever is there inside the my code, right? My code dot Java file, whatever is it. The assertions are enabled only for the my class file. So if there is an assert statement inside the my class one, that is ignored. The um, assert statement inside the my class are alone considered. If I do selectively do the minus EA my class. If I simply put minus EA my code, right? minus EA my code, then the assertions are enabled for all the classes inside my code. If I specifically put this class name, then it is enabled only for this class name. Now I can enable it for a package by using the almost the same syntax, except that I have to keep the package name. Then, uh, yeah, so, so by default, it is disabled. If you want to enable it is when you use it. So you simply give Java my code, right? Then it is disabled. If I want to specifically enable the uh, assertions, then I have to put minus here. Now I'm saying that, okay, this is disabled. So this is by default disabled globally, but you are more specifying this. What you can do is you can say, okay, minus EA for my class, minus DA for my class. So all these combinations are possible okay, for you to enable and disable. So here, uh, I think you should have the quotes here. Yeah. Okay, now this is for a package and this is for a class. So all these combinations are possible. So these are like for system classes. If you want system classes are, uh, understand I, oh. okay, let me just check and get back to it. System classes are certain 
define the classes inside uh, Java. So I don't think it is a default packages which are given by Java, Java, but there are some specific classes which are identified system classes if you want to enable assertions for them to check if the, this is not related to the program code that you have written, but instead something specific to system classes, that's where these assertions are enabled. Okay, so logging is again one more way to uh, you know track the uh, diagnostic message. So rather than printing them on the console, you actually log it somewhere in some file or some console wherever uh, you want to print this. System. And these get logged over the period of time, like the, while the code is running, right? I mean, it, it keeps getting logged. Then if you are uh, if you have a uh, some some uh, you know a web server which is running and you want to log so many people this people person has logged in this people has logged so these things everything you can log in using the logger and uh, finally at the end of the day you can just go through the logger to get a lot of information so yeah so by default so you have you can actually see that there are seven levels of messaging one is severe warning info i'm just rushing through because i think you are need to answer questions on the mark also and i have reflection also Okay, so there are seven levels of messages. Say severe warning, info, conflict, fine, finer, and finest. By default, the first three are enabled. Even if you don't mention anything, these are enabled. Now, if I say I want to um, log till finer, so if I say the logger level is fine, yeah, fine. Then starting from this, all five are logged. It is not like only fine is logged. When I say level dot fine, it is not the fine that is logged. It is severe warning, info, conflict, fine. Everything. So this is the decreasing uh, severity of messages, supposedly. So whatever is the most severe, then is this until whatever level you want to set it, until that uh, all the messages which are more severe than the level which equal to or more severe than the level which you have set, that's, that would be not. You can of course turn on all uh, levels, turn off all levels by using these methods. Then, uh, yeah, you can control the logging from within too to external configuration. I'll just go to the reflection quickly. So you don't have to worry about this part, uh, you know, asking us ask, wondering whether you'll be asked how many methods and all that. Clearly, you will not be able to answer. And even we do not expect you to go through Java documentation or anything to figure out. Anything. So it's just more for your information. Um, yeah, in quiz questions, you won't be asked questions which you cannot answer without them. I mean, you, there is no recall kind of questions, right? I, except for very basic um, concept related syntax. So reflection or program, reflection, reflective programming or reflection is the ability of a process to examine, introspect, and modify its own structural behavior. So introspection means a program can observe and therefore reason or it, it can it can say why why is it in a certain state and why not it's in a certain state, right? So that is the introspection. Intercedence, it can modify. So it's not just observing and reasoning, but it can also modify its current execution state and uh, alter its own interpretation or meaning. So don't worry about this terminology. How is reflection done in Java? So we want to know a certain thing about the class that we are running. We want to know the number of methods, the fields, the, the constructors. So not for this class alone. So if you want to know about, see, there could be a hierarchy in which there are, say, 10 classes. As well. So Class one is the parent of class two, then class three, then class four, then class five. So if you, from class one, if you just want to know all the methods that have been declared, you can use this uh, reflection in Java using the, the class, the method, the field, the constructor, all these are classes in Java as well, because everything in Java is kind of class and object, right? So, yeah, so if you want to know the type of a certain object, for instance, you want to know about E, what you will do here. So, so. So here, if you want to know about E, you can just take instance of manager. But what if you do not know what, what is a possible type of an object that came from? In such case, what do you do? Then you use what is, okay. Then you want, what what you actually want to know is, see, I have got an object of O, O1, object of O2, which are, each of them are, you know, objects of two different classes, or maybe possibly the same different class or whatever, and you want to know whether these are the same, then what you generally do is you actually use the get class method for C01 also you take the get class method, O2 also you get, take the get class method, and you compare if these two are equal. If these are the same, then it means that both are uh, objects of the same class. Okay, so these are the ways in which you can check and then you have the get class method and you can, once you get the get class method here, 
then this is the this means that it is say some manager class or something. Then if you say new instance, then for object O, object O equal to it's almost like new manager, right? So something like this. This is what happens. So you're creating an object of manager and assigning it to object. Yeah. So you are using it using a string. Then you are using it directly using the string without even declaring this as a string. So different ways of creating an object of a class using the get class method. Yeah. So what are the uh, what are the details about a class that you want to get? You want to get the details about constructors, its methods, and its fields, which are the instance variables. Right. So if you have a method, sorry, if you have a constructor, what are the things that are specific? So you know that the constructor doesn't have a return type, right? So the one thing that you want to know about the Construct is the argument. So if it's a parameterized constructor, it can have many uh, combinations of parameters. And depending on that, that is, that is the more specific things that you want to know about the constructor. So if you, in the constructor class, you have ways to know about the arguments. In the methods, methods are identified by arguments as well as it could also have the return type. And uh, for all three of them, for constructors, methods, and fields, we could have different access specifiers like uh, uh, static access modifiers, like static private public policies. Right? So the, all these information, you can get it from the uh, classes which are provided by Java, the constructor class, method class, field class. And yeah, get constructor. So I am sure if you have done the uh, programming assignment, you will know like what these things mean. If you want to know specifically what is the same, for instance, information about the private methods, and you use the get declared methods, get declared fields. Now, um, yeah, for instance, for constructors, say for constructor class has this get parameter. As I told you, right, constructors, what is more important is the arguments, right? How the constructors are differentiated is arguments. So for every constructor, you can see what are the parameter types of the constructor. For methods, you can see the arguments as well as the return type. So, I mean, you can, uh, for, uh, I mean, each are, all of these things are provided by the class constructor, class method, and class field. So each of these will have the methods which are specific to that particular. Yeah, one thing that we should think was so the whole idea of object-orientedness encapsulation everything was to keep the data safe, data-centric thing, right? What, what gives access to the data? So it's more of the, the methods, the private method. That we, so when we are actually, so Java has provided a number of classes and I'm going to develop a code, I'm going to give it to somebody and have declared certain things as private with the intention that only my code, I should have been able to access this. The other person should not be able to know. But if that person writes a code and uh, gets this get declared field, get declared methods, get declared constructors, I'm actually exposing the private fields and methods and everything that I have, right? So it's kind of a security issue. So what is the point in giving out, you know, what is the point in even declaring it as private, right? So uh, finally, if you have the, if you get the full signature of a private method, then kind of, it's kind of not very useful in that sense, right? So um, there is another thing which is, uh, there is a method. So, uh, I think the name of the class is accessible object or accessible list. I think accessible object at this go with this. It has some method called set accessible. Okay, so set accessible method will actually enable you to uh, say whether this uh, reflection related queries can be generated on this particular class or not. Okay. So I'm not going to detail of that. All that we should be aware of is this is definitely a security issue. So if you are ever going to write a code and give it to someone, just be just ensure that there is also something called a security manager class. So you can you have to make use of all these things to ensure that even though Java gives these provisions, you have to keep your classes and data and everything safe. And it should be like it should be only accessible to those those um, available to only those uh, entities. Uh, who, who should be able to access. So based on that, you should set these set access in the two or false depending on how it should be done. Okay, so with that, we come to the end of reflection also. Uh, yeah, Nalini, you want to go ahead? I think I'll yeah, 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 yes. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so now we create concepts. The first part is cloning. So yeah. Uh, you have employee object, even employee object, even employee object. Now, if you want to create new employee E2, that means you want separate memory for E1 and also separate memory for E2. So how can you do that? You can, uh, so if you say employee E2 equal to E1, that means 
both so e1 is having some memory no that means you are referring both e1 and e2 are referring to the same memory you are not creating the new object here so in order to create the new object what you can do is the you can use the clone method you can say e1 dot clone that means what happens here is like you will get new object you will get e1 you will get separate memory for e2 also you will get separate memory and whatever the values which are there in e1 now e1 has let's say it has string name field name as a field and also age now here whatever the values it has now it has sono and 40 you know instance variable has values of sono and 40 that will be copied here also so you will get new object and you will get the values will be same it will start with whatever the values e1 has now if you want to change if you change the values of e2 that won't that won't be going to affect in e1 if you change the values of e1 that will won't affect the e2 because they have different memory uh, yeah uh, so but yeah this is provided by the object class object class has a clone method that enables you to do this and the uh, how it does this is like object class does a bitwise copy that means whatever the values the instance variables is holding that this bitwise copy the object class clone method will do it does shallow copy basically so if you have object inside your employee class let's take it has some promotion date promotion date is a new class is a other another class and yeah if it has this also as instance variable and then if you do this even dot clone what will happen is you will get new here you will get new object for both even and e2 now sonu and 40 will be copied here but promotion date this is object no so this will be pointing to some memory location yeah and now you will get sonu and 40 also here this this is this will be pointing to this same memory location because it is an object so what it what here employee class is storing here is like the memory address only you know this heap memory address will be stored here you no know? that will be copied here so both will be pointing to the same memory location so if you change the promotion date in e1 it will be going to affect in e2 also if you change promotion date in e2 it will be going to affect in e1 so in order to do this uh, in order to avoid the shallow copying you need to do deep cloning how to do deep cloning you need to recursively clone the next set objects as well that means you need to clone this also you need to you need to clone the promotion data also that means you will get new memory for so how can you do e e2 dot promotion date some something equal to e1 dot promotion date called clone promotion date dot clone that means you are cloning the that the promotion date also that means you will get new memory for promotion date for both even and like for even there will be separate memory for e2 will be there will be separate memory okay in order to do all these things like in order to use the clone method in your class the class must implement the clonable interface the class must implement the clonable interface and it should override the clone method okay yeah it is like the clone method is protected by default in the object class you need to override as public if needed that means if there is a class called manager yeah the manager will be going to have this uh, clone method which is there for the employee also but yeah the thing is like in order to access it from outside or from outside you should make it to public also yeah clone method in the object throws clone not supported exception so you should the method the clone method is throwing the clone not exception no? so whenever you call the clone method that means in, from the main method you you will create the object of e1 and you, you will create the like you will call the clone method for this e2 no so that time you should enclose this the things the whenever you are calling the clone method you should enclose that in try catch or you should tell that main method will throw clone not supported exception yeah that is the thing yeah if anyone has doubt you can ask regarding this clone will if not we'll move to the next topic okay i hope no one has doubt yeah uh, so java is uh, statically typed language no? the type of the variable should be declared in advance but yeah but java allows some limited type inference so yeah here so what is the advantage of 
like here what is the advantage of not declaring the type redundancy so you are saying here employee equal to new employee so here also you are saying employee and here is also you are using the employee so in order to avoid this kind of redundancy it can be type inference can be the use is use of type type inference is this in order to avoid the redundancy of this yeah java allows limited type inference it allows only type inference for the local variables you cannot use uh, type inference for the in instance variable so how does the type inference happen it happens it uh, what so the where where b is assigned to false that means is assigned to some boolean value so b must be so the compiler just based on its value the value to which it is assigned it just predicts the b must be of type boolean here s is assigned to string so here s must be string based on this the value assigned only it will the compiler will check to which value the s is assigned okay it is assigned to string so it will so it will be of type string it, it does that and 2.0 if you say 2.0 yeah basically it is double no but if you want to use float if the type has to be float then you should use f here so by seeing f and the f it will understand this is of type float so the where is now the f will be of type float here no where e equal to new manager so if uh, employ if manager is subclass of uh, so now you have employee and manager and manager if manager is subclass of uh, employee then yeah if manager is subclass of employee then what you can do you can assign no you can say here employee equal employee equal to new manager that means parent class reference can hold a child class object no that can you can do but what type inference will does is it will does most constraint constraint type so now this is an object of manager so the this type must be manager that it will do but if you want if you want employee to hold this you need to say explicitly like you need to typecast it to employee now if you if manage if employee needs to hold this value okay employee equal to new manager if it has to happen then you need to typecast it employee of type employee then you, you can say new manager yeah that means you need to do this explicitly then then this var will be replaced by employee if not if you say new manager then this will be of type manager only e will be of type manager only okay yeah the thing is this type inference can be done can be used only for local variables uh, if you do if you say if you have instance variable if you say where some x or y then it will give compiler error because it can be done all only on local variables here and the thing is you must initialize at the time of declaration so if you are not initializing and if you only declare then it then also it will use compiler error because it doesn't know the type of b yeah that that's all about this type inference okay now coming to the higher order functions higher order functions passing a function as an argument to other function so uh, yeah uh, basically what the function will take function will take some parameters but basically whatever you have seen till now like it in, now you are not passing function to a function no? but java uh, can allow like uh, yeah like python also like python also enables this uh, it also enables to pass function as argument to other function uh, so how can you do this lambda expressions enables us to do this what are lambda expressions lambda expressions are unknown an anonymous functions uh sorry lambda expressions are anonymous functions yeah they have parameter they are anon anonymous functions the the syntax is like they have this parameter and then the body uh, so if if you want to add two numbers uh let's say two numbers so it, if the method is going to take two arguments a and b you can simply say a plus b then the return type is implicit and here also you are not specifying the type of arguments you know, these are also implicit the return value and the type of the parameters are implicit here you you can specify but it's okay even if you are not specifying that okay interfaces so when when you can use this lambda expressions so you can 
so the the thing is like you can pass a function as an argument to another function by using the lambda expressions these are anonymous function that means they doesn't have any name here the syntax is like you have parameter and then body and the return value and type are implicit so when to use this lambda expression this can be only used if you have functional interfaces uh, that means examples are comparator Com uh, functional interfaces are interfaces that have only one abstract method in it it can have any number of default methods or any number of static method but the condition is it must have only one abstract method there should not be two or three or something like that you should have only one abstract method in that case you can use the lambda expression lambda expressions are also called as an instance instances of functional interfaces okay now example is comparator what the comparator has it has compare method the comparator has compare method this is abstract method compare abstract method. comparator is an interface this is similar to what comparable interface here the difference is like comparable interface will take only one object as parameter but here it takes two object two objects that that you are comparing that you should give as argument to the compare method in, the, in which is present inside the comparable comparator interface so it is a good example of com, in functional interface no so it has uh, uh, only one abstract method so when uh, when we are so arrays dot sort method this method is basically used to sort your arrays okay whatever arrays integer double or in arrays so in that okay you need to here arrays dot sort will take the array will take the array as one argument and also this comparator comparator instance of uh, this functional interface comparator as another argument so as it is a functional interface instead of creating a new class and defining the what defining the compare function inside that class and co and creating the instance of that class instead of doing all these things simply you can use lambda in place of this functional interface comparator comparator what here you are doing is like you are passing this str array and here you are taking the two string as it takes two strings as arguments no so you are taking giving two arguments and how you are comparing these two strings by comparing the length so what this compare function basically do it will return one if you are if uh, if s1 dot length is greater than s2 dot uh, s2 dot length yeah, if basically it will return 1 minus 1 or 0 if two of if if this the if the current objects value is greater than the object the value of the object which you intended to compare let's say s dot uh, uh, something s dot value this is your current object this is the object with which you are comparing if that is greater then it will return one if it is less if your current object value is less than the object with which you are comparing then it will return minus one if it is both the object has same value then it will give zero so if you say s1 dot length minus s2 dot length if s1 length is greater than s2 length it will return some positive number no if it if it is less it will return some negative number if both are same then it will return zero so basically instead of doing all the things you just uh, you are just replacing this instance of this functional interface with the lambda expression yeah that is the advantage of this lambda expression it's a clear for everyone what what does the lambda expression means so if you if your method has multiple if the lambda expression has multiple lines in this in your body so in the body of lambda expression then you can use this parent uh, this kind of notation okay now you can write the blocks of uh, you can write your cloud block in this uh, um, parenthesis okay that is lambda expression and if the lambda expressions consists of single functional call that means here let's take example of merge function in this of the map so what this map has this merge function it it basically helps in merging the two maps what it takes this merge function will take a key a value and also the function with uh, to uh, by which you need to combine these two what maps so it basically combines merges both the map one and map two and it will create new map let's say that as map so it will take key value and also a function with which you need to not function it it will take some functional interface as parameter with which you intended to merge these two maps 
yeah that is these are the arguments of this match function so basically what you are trying to do here here is like you have a player and yeah whatever the runs you are, he has whatever the score he has scored you are trying to match in like if you do if you wanted to do that that means it's a simple addition of the values which are present in the both the maps instead of writing this lambda expression like this a comma b then you instead of doing all these things you can just call integer colon colon sum that means you are calling some method the, the sum method which is already present in the integer class that this is a single uh, what you are doing nothing you are just calling that function that means you are not comparing you are not checking whether it is greater than or less than or equal to zero something you are not doing but just calling a single function uh, instead of writing the lambda expression in that case you can just directly call the function so this is called the method reference yeah this is like impl uh, this is the implicit way of doing this okay uh, so the yeah if if that method this this method is static method sum is static method that's why you are calling uh, integer colon colon is to sum sum dot colon colon sum if it is an instance method if the class has some instance method so you you would need to use the object of the class let's take employee and i will say bonus if this is instance instance method no so no parenthesis nothing uh, so yeah so here if you are trying to call the instance method uh, then you need to use the object of that class and then you need to use colon colon notation and then you should uh, call that method particular method okay if you are trying to call some pre uh, like some method which is present in some other class let's say string concatenate that method that is you are trying to call this in some from some other class then you can directly use string concatenate but this uh, yeah that thing you can do okay coming to this streams so streams are not data structures okay streams uh, streams are not uh, like array list or arrays or something it is not data structured which is uh, which it is not holding any values it's just a collection uh, uh, what it is just a what collection of uh, not collection we can you uh, we can view the collection as a stream of elements okay it is not a collection but we can view the collection as a stream of elements because so let's take a real estate has some elements no uh, list of elements so all uh, this elements can be viewed as stream of elements okay why why this uh, the purpose of the stream is like it enables you to do the easy processing so if you wanted to do some uh, what processing over a list or a map how you need to write the for loop and you need to iterate over the elements but if you use stream if you convert that list or that collections to stream then it enables you to easy processing and it is like a declarative way, uh, declarative form of way of computing that means you are not telling how to do you are just telling i want it to be done uh, what to do you will, you will tell you will simply get the output that is like a declarative way of computing it enables us to do easy processing that's the use of streams okay create a stream okay now in order to create uh, in order to convert collections to stream you can just say okay you have list object l list you can say l dot stream of that will give you stream Stream. similarly you can call stream on any collection object stream on any collection object so if you use the stream function that will give you stream of that list and if you wanted to uh, get a collection from arrays if you wanted to make arrays as a collection uh, arrays as a stream then you can use stream of method stream of uh, like you can say stream of some arr array that will give the stream of the arrays and yeah uh, instead of creating stream from arrays or collections you can generate the stream by yourself by using some functions yeah like dot generate and also dot iterate okay that will be covered in this slide yeah now so now what here we are doing here is like uh, yeah word words let's take this words as a list and you know you are converting dot stream if you say dot stream that means i'm converting the words list to stream and now dot filter now if i use filter function that means 
so it filters the elements based on this criteria so now you have this stream of elements now you are passing through some filter now you will get only the uh, stream of elements that has passed this condition that has qualified this condition other elements you want to get as the result okay and if you want to count the number of elements such such elements you can use dot method okay dot method on that stream so now here you are counting uh, the words which with the length greater than 10 that is happening here just you are filtering the words with the length greater than the 10 and then you are counting it's simply you are telling you are not iterating over the each and every element of your list and you are not doing you're simply writing filter function and you will getting out okay yeah now stream also enables you to do parallel parallel processing that means uh, so here first filtering is happening here and then after filtering you will you are counting here but now if you say words dot parallel stream that means if you are uh, now counting and filtering is happening parallelly so if if it has found one element which with the length greater than 10 so count will be updated simultaneously it will be updated to one if it has either if it has found other element count will be updated to two so both parallelly it is happening but here first filtering is happening and then counting so this enables you to do parallel processing also that means you can do multiple things simultaneously on the streams so yeah how can you create the stream uh, you can instead of creating from list or arrays you can generate your own stream by saying this calling the starting method stream dot generate it generates the stream by, by by using this whatever function you if you uh, which you give as argument so if you say stream dot generate generate of some some function any function uh, actually echo or something then it will give infinite things infinite infinite echo echo you will get as streams but you can limit like you can say i want only tell particular numbers so you can limit so limit 100 that means you will get only 100 elements and at the other way is also like okay you can say uh, you can use stream dot generate of math dot random that will give infinite random numbers but in order to limit like to certain value you can use the limit function limit of 100 or limit of 10 whatever how many elements you want yeah that so stream dot generate basically generates a stream by by taking the function with the help of this function whatever you, you will give and stream dot iterate it will generate the stream of dependent values so how can you use the stream dot iterate in order how can you generate here so you you can start from any value let's take 10 and then uh, how you need to update your next value based on this condition and n plus 2 and this that means you will get stream of infinite numbers also here also so you will get 10 12 14 etc so on uh, in order to limit this you can use limit something like that you can write limit or you can just keep some condition uh, so you can use some condition also you can say stream dot iterate and some condition 10 and you can check for some condition n must be uh, less than 40 that means you will get only and and you need to update the next element based on this condition n is to n plus 2 that means you are updating the next element so the stream of dependent values why you are saying this because you are getting the next element based on this certain uh, criteria only no so whatever the next element you are getting that is based on the current element that's why it is called stream of dependent values and yeah you can use limit or you can just give some condition and you can terminate this iterate or this infinite stream okay and fill there are many methods which are inbuilt methods which are present in the stream you can use them yeah filter methods just filters the elements based on some set uh, based on the predicate as an uh, like whatever method which you give it to filter that will allow only those elements to pass through and you will get the output map whatever you do 
so you need to apply some fun apply some function to each and every element of your stream so you can use map function so you uh, so whatever the elements which are present in your stream you need to multiply it by 10 then how can you can use simple one map function uh, so yeah uh, so now here uh, so now I got stream of these words, you know. Now I need to map whatever the elements, uh, whatever the length of these elements, uh, I need to increase it by 10. So that means I can say uh, I, that is one first element, I is the element, I dot length plus 10. That means uh, actually words is a string. That means so I can say I dot length plus string. So this will um, uh, apply to each and every element of your stream. So whatever the elements which are present in this word stream, that all the elements will be, uh, the values will be, length value will be updated by 10. Yeah, that's. And so by using this map function, you can apply this function to each and every element in your stream. And flat map, uh, flat at map will collapse so if you have if you have nested a list as output then you can just flatten it to single dimension by calling this flat map function and yeah so limit function we have already discussed and skip off n if you say skip off 10 the first 10 elements will be skipped from your stream and you will get the next elements following elements and the take while and this drop file so yeah So, yeah, uh, now you have some, okay, I will use iterate and generate some numbers, okay. Iterate uh, from 1 to n plus 1, that means I'm just incrementing the next element value by 10. Uh, and then, okay, there should be some condition also n is to n less than 10 so i am taking only 10 elements and then i am yeah now i uh, now what take while method does is like so what will be the values of your stream 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 no okay now if you say take while okay you you will take only if n percentile 2 is equal to equal to 0 that means uh, so, uh, so first element is one, you no? Know? Yeah, it won't take, it won't, it won't take. So you will get an empty stream. So initially it is uh, one. So it won't, it won't take, it won't, it will, it won't take, it, it won't take elements at all because it will stops when an element outmatches your criteria. Uh, so here it is not matching your criteria which you have mentioned here. No, here n percentile two is. 10. that means you need to get zero as reminder here for the first element you are getting as one as reminder uh, so this is violating your criteria so it will stop it won't iterate it will stops it won't iterate you won't get it as output but if your first element is two four and next element is three and then what you will get is so first element is matching criteria okay you will get this two as output and the second element four is also matching this criteria you will get four as output but the third element this the third element is three in percentile two is not zero so it will stop so even if you have other elements after this if you have 10 or if you have 12 after this three that won't that elements won't come into picture it will take only if it matches the criteria once once if it find one element is outmatching the criteria it won't take the rest of the elements the drop file does opposite of this so it will drop the elements uh, so what drop drop file will do is okay so i will take the same criteria Uh, what it does is uh, so yeah uh, you have one two three four so on to ten members so you will say if n percentile equal uh, by two uh, equal to ten that uh, equal to zero that means even numbers it will drop it will drop all the even numbers now you have from one to so now you have stream of one two three four ten yeah so on to ten members uh, so it will so first element first element what it 
does it match in the criteria or it is not matching the criteria it is not satisfying the criteria no so it will drop that element second element is matching the criteria uh, so what it does so it will print all the other elements two three four five all elements will get as output so drop elements will drop till it unmatches uh, till it matches the criteria it will drop till the condition is matched if it is not matching then all other elements will be printed so start after the element out matches the criteria it will if it if the element is matching the criteria it will drop that element if it has found the one element which is not matching the criteria then it will start printing all the elements take while will take all the elements which are matching the criteria if it has found the one element which is not matching the criteria it will stop it will it won't take it will stop iterating here and so take while will stop when the element outmatches a criteria start after element outmatches a criteria that means it will drop if it is matching the criteria it will drop okay so in order to count the number of elements in your stream you can use count in order to find the largest and smallest values of your stream you can use max and min these methods will take compare to method as some you need to give some compare comparing criteria no so compare to method you need to give now in order to find the first element of your stream you need to use the find first method so if your stream is empty uh, what happens if your stream is empty it will return optional type uh, so okay you are doing some processing on your list finally some filtering you are doing something uh, some filtering you did and the stream and stream output is like you got an empty stream after filtering so uh, the value uh, you uh, that time the return value of that function is an optional type yeah that is will be discussed in the later weeks also yeah okay that's all from me kate okay thank you if you have any doubt you can ask from me kate yeah okay ma'am now if you have any doubts regarding mock or quiz you can ask now ma'am i have a doubt in uh, question number three of the mock definitely sure Before can we look at the, uh, the two question two? Uh, why is the thing return, the tree returning negative order? I mean, no, just one second. We'll just fix. Uh, look at the second, third question first, okay? Because you asked first. No? We'll come to that second question. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. The thing is, I can't write here. Uh, okay. So, are you able to see this blank presentation also? No. Yes. Okay. Blank. Okay. Uh, now you have this uh, class person, and it has some instance variables, constructor, and okay. Now you have this class person. Just give me a second. Just. I will copy the code to um, our PDF and then write. Yeah, just a second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now here you have this class person, 
and person is a class and it has some instance variables constructor and two string method you are overriding here and the class employee is extending person and that is implementing the clonable interface so you can use clone method on this class yeah okay so uh, so the now here in the main method you are creating an array of employee uh, so what you are creating here even even is array of employee employee array this is employee array okay now yeah and now you are saying employee array e2 that means you will get new array even dot clone you are calling no that means you will get new array new array e2 and yeah now this whatever the what are the values of employee array it's it is an employee object no so it will so employee ob object will be storing here somewhere here in the heap in your heap here also next element is also another employee object it will be storing somewhere here. what here it will be there is some reference something some location let's take 100 here it will be let's take 104 something like that okay now here what are the values here hurry and 30 here the uh, second object values are Gita and 23 now if i say employee e2, array e2 equal to e1 dot clone that means i am getting new array of for e2 now what what values the employee e2 will be assigned so whatever the values which e1 has that means so it will do so it will be having thousand here it will be having 1004 here so thousand is referring to this memory location hurry and 30 this summary memory location hurry and 30 and uh, yeah this uh, this is referring to 1004 this is uh, pointing to this memory location uh, gita 23 so now if you say e1 e2 dot one dot name that means the first element e2 dot e2 of one that means the first element of your array dot name that means this name if you are changing it to rani then it will be reflected in both e1 and e2 no because even this employee uh, this this is pointing to the same memory e1 and e2 are pointing to this new an employee object which is pointing to the same memory so it will get rani and sub comma rani you will get if you try to print e1 of one that means two string method is overridden in in your class no so it will give in the formatted output so name colon is to h so you will get rani is to 30 and same you will get rani is to 30 that's that's e2 one is uh, okay gita will be changed yeah yeah uh, so e2 one okay even of one okay even of one you know one sorry this is zero sorry i i took i i i took first element it should be uh, this element no gita no so gita will be changed to rani and uh, yeah uh, here also uh, for even also it will be changed to rani rani is to 23 and rani is, is it clear if not i will explain once more if it is somewhat confusing um, you can but tell. Uh, like yeah. uh, i changed the type of the even like uh, in local system i took the string array two string array and trying to clone it then i changed the like first string of that and uh, not getting the same result now um, like uh, uh, the uh, even uh, okay that, you want if you wanted to do deep cloning if you wanted to do deep uh, what this output you are not matching whatever the output which which is given in the answer it is not matching or what is the problem actually i haven't it's, got it it's different man. like uh, in this case rani and rani is printed mm. uh, got it but uh, like uh, when i created a string error Mm. then the uh, like the output is not matching they are they are different okay the difference is like now here this is uh, what this even is array even is storing some employee object here so these are mutable these are new objects but string are immutable no so if if i have created one string array So this you got now, whatever I have told now, employee regarding employee. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Now, if there is some string array, string array is one, some strings. 
let's take some strings some names rahul and geeta okay now string s2 you have array you have and uh, it is taking some values like uh, okay now you need to call clone method no s1 dot clone you need to call yeah if you do this what happens here is like so s1 you have s2 you have so what s1 is storing here rahul and here it is storing geeta here if you say s2 you got new memory what it will store it will store rahul and geeta okay if you change s2 value something to uh, nalini if you say it to if you have changed it to nalini then it will it won't reflect in s1 because this and this is separate memory but it is if it is an employee employee has another uh, the, actually the object is stored in heap no employee object it will so what actually it will store is this it is storing ad address the memory location it will store in the place of the first element yeah in the place of second element will store the address there if it is an object type but it is like immutable now strings are immutable no uh, so yeah that's why if you change in s1 it won't be reflected in s2 because here directly you are storing rahul and geeta but yeah here you are st uh, storing directly rahul and geeta that's why if you here you are getting new memory and rahul and geeta you are storing and then if you change one that won't affect but previously you have this yeah you have this employee array employee array has is storing some employee object here first element of the, your employee array is some employee object that is created somewhere in your heap what here you are storing is some memory address of this location in this here uh, so yeah here what here you will get in the new cloned array you will also get that memory address so if you change this that will be going to reflected in both of them the thing is happening because because if you have this immutable objects like integer floats double strings char character boolean these are immutable objects so if you change that whatever the shallow there won't be shallow copying for them so whatever you do that will be that will happen deep copying for them so even if you do shallow cloning that will happen deep cloning for them yeah but for the mutable objects like employee student or some any other object that means yeah for them you need to do deep cloning yeah if you have some array of students also you need to clone the array and in order to get the what deep cloned object you need to clone that student also separately array cloning you need to do and also cloning of the students also you need to do you know to get deep cloning that means you need to recursively clone the object there but for the Im immutable objects for strings and uh, integers doubles all this you need to just simply clone the array that's all that will be enough but in you know, for object types you need to for mutable objects you need to recursively deep clone okay got it thank you yeah uh, yeah second question no Yeah, second question also i will copy the code and then yeah ma'am we gave the gave a reference also but that is still confusing to me so i still can't figure out why is in reverse order uh, okay okay we'll see we'll see uh, hello ma'am yeah uh, after this uh, can you discuss the question number 7 11 13 and 15 yeah we'll see okay second question no yeah but better thing is i think i can copy this somewhere to document and i will post no the, actually the thing is simple okay uh, yeah uh, okay what's your doubt i thought the order should be 1 2 4 6 because it is ascending but okay. the actual answer is 6 4 2 1 Okay. Okay. Just see. Okay. This. Uh, oh, because the compare to is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So actually, you are using preset. So how it compares the elements based on the compare to function which you give. Uh, so uh, compare to function you are giving. What you are giving here is you are returning one if your object value is less than the 
object with which you are comparing then you are returning one so basically in order to get ascending order what you will do if your object value is greater than the object with which you are comparing you will return one here you are doing opposite way no this is your objects this objects wheels but the compared object wheels is v v dot wheels that the compared object wheels is v if your current objects wheels is less than this v wheels then you are returning one that is not no if you are if it is less if your object value is less than the object value with your company you should return minus one so you are doing it in vice versa uh, so you will get the in descending order not in the ascending order but default is ascending order but in order to get the descending order you are using this that's why okay, okay. I, yeah I, I missed the fact that compared to is uh, overridden here thank you mm -hmm. okay yeah next is which question ma'am question number seven question yeah this can, can you do this just we discuss it no okay just i will explain quickly okay we have no time now stream dot generate of math dot rand, random so you are generating the stream of numbers from the random values okay random value uh, from you will get the numbers between 0 and 1 and you are saying limit 100 so limit you are keeping as 100 that means only 100 numbers you will get so dot map of i is to uh, i plus 10 so what you are do, doing is you are incrementing its value by 10 so whatever values which you are there and which which you get from the this random method 100 random numbers you are incrementing those values by 10 okay if there is like 0 then it will be 10 if there is 0 0.1 then it will be 10.1 that you, you that will happen so you are calling math dot mac dot max of random dot this double compared to method you are giving so max function will give the maximum uh, value out of those uh, the random numbers so now you are trying to print that value okay what will be the value you will get the numbers uh, you will get the maximum number no only one number you will get not the string not some numbers between zero not some stream of numbers you will get you will get one number maximum number the highest number after performing this operation uh, so what will be the output this generates compiler error no right this won't generate compiler error this program generates the output a random optional double between uh, zero and one no you won't get zero and one because the values are incremented by 10 no so your values will be 10 to 11 only no because the values uh, the math dot random function will generate the values between 0 and 1 so if you are incrementing the values by 10 then uh, whatever the values that are there so 10 plus 0 what will happen 10 and 10 uh, what 10 plus 1 what will happen 11 so you will get the values between 0 uh, 10 and 11 only no the program generates the optional a random optional value between 10 and 11 not stream that's why this is wrong so you will get random optional double between 10 uh, and 11 uh, wh why stream will not be returned because math math max you will have only one max value as from as the maximum value of the stream no so it won't be that so you will you okay, can okay. have many values but the maximum value will be like let's say it will be 10.9 let's say it is 10.1 that value will be returned it won't return 10.9 10.9 or 10.1 that values it won't return it will return only single value maximum and minimum it will return only single optional value okay uh, ma'am if it doesn't have a ma max Thanks. value then it means uh, it will generate a stream right yeah it will generate stream of 100 numbers between 10 and 11 mm -hmm yeah okay next question is question number 11 okay question number 11 okay we'll see if yeah okay i will see this do you want me to do this yeah yeah okay uh, yeah okay ma'am you can do yeah should i stop staring uh, yeah, yeah i'll just share yeah This one, right? So, who was asking Rakesh, right? Rakesh? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. What is confusing in this? You know the answer of this question. Tell me what is confusing in this. Uh, like uh, multiple tries and try and catch, like uh, in nested. Okay, you so tell me that, what that is the order of execution. So, program comes yes, here. Yes. This is the main, right? Entry point. 
then you are declaring an object of uh, test class and then you invoking the method show comes here. Now you tell me what happens. Uh, then it should come in the try block. This try, yeah. Then. Okay. Then uh, next, uh, then next try, yeah. and catch then again try. So it was like a little bit confusing. Okay. So what happens like if there is an be, exception? Uh, if an exception should, happens here, yeah. What come? What happens then? It comes so that should be arithmetic. Way. Yeah, yeah. Arithmetic exception. Yeah. Then what happens? Then uh, it will get out of it, or uh, it no, will no. get the, so, yeah. the next. So the confusion, try. what you have is like, see, if there was another statement after this try, right? That does not get executed. Whatever comes after catch, I mean, when there is something that comes after catch, it means that whatever has to be done with the exception that has been raised in this try block has been handled. Now the next try is just like any other Java statement for this code. It could be a simply assignment statement, could be a simple uh, print statement. Just like that, it is executing the next, which is another try block. Okay, okay. What, and message, MSG is an instance variable of this. So it just gets overwritten by the next uh, error message also. Because there is a string index out of one's exception also, which is generated. So it's simply, it is this instance variable is getting overwritten by the new message. That's it. And finally, okay, we'll okay, print out it. that instance variable. Uh, yes, ma'am, got it. Oh, actually, this message get overridden, no? This message this is... variable, no? it's an instance variable of the class, mm. right? So because it's getting executed in this order, the first time the arithmetic exception gets executed, and if there was no exception raised here, then you get the arithmetic exception only printed. But because there is an exception which is raised here, and it's the same variable that gets overwritten, finally, when you print, you, <coughs> you print the last exception that was encountered. That's it. Very, very, uh, you know, <laughs> Called the question. So sorry, this is a very interesting question. So very involved. Yeah, it's very interesting. But you should. I mean, ideally, Madan sir always says that you should never do things like this. I mean, it's like simply testing the syntax and trying to. I mean, functionally, very rarely use these things. Yeah. Sorry, and just say. just to confirm, if suppose yeah. there is no message. It is just a throw, right? Then a throw from inside the catch is. Yeah. So, or suppose there is some return or whatever. So it won't go to the next try, right? Yeah, if there is a return or a throw, I mean, yeah, then, then it is not being handled the way, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not like a real, uh, a graceful exit, right? So throwing further exception, right? So it's not really, yeah. But yeah, that is right. See, whatever is here, you are confused by this try statement. Whatever, if there was a system dot out dot println statement, and if there was a throw message inside here, what would have happened? It would have simply thrown that error and exited, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. just like yes. that, yeah. Just like any other Java statement from try onwards, it's just like any other Java statement. What is there inside the try will not get executed once you encounter an exception within this block. That's it. Yeah. Okay, so what is the next question? Uh, um, question number 13. 14, yeah. Yeah, okay. Here again, can you tell me what was your confusion? So we start here, like the main program. To create an object of this class details class, and then you have a get details method in book. Get details is a method inside this class itself. And then what happens? Yeah, tell me what is the T for the first this one for this one? What is the T here? So, what is the confusion? Can you tell me? Like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, no, uh, no, I, I got this, I got this. Like, what is like it, no? it will, yeah, yeah. yeah. It will first go to this LED TV and that prints this picture quality of the name, what you're passing is the LED, LED TV is good. Then you have, um, yeah, then you have the smart TV, which is going here. So inside smart, it is invoking the features method of its parent class, which is this LED class, right? So it will print what, what is the string now here? The string now is the, whatever it got from the, as parameter to the method, right? Which is smart. So this smart variable will go inside here and it will print picture quality of smart TV is good. That also gets printed. Then it will print this print, print statement, which is smart TV is similar, similar to LED TV. That's it. Got it, no? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We just have to traverse through the code. That's it. There is nothing complicated. And just remember that here it is T extends TV. TV is the parent class of both. Parent, this is something like ancestor of 
smart TV, variant of LED TV, right? So something like that. So that's why this is all moving. Okay. okay. Next is a 15. Question 15, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. Question number 15. And the job produces compilation error. Uh, Figure is line three. The cell data and A. So just one second. Okay. 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 So this is inside a um hold on one second. Okay. So because this is private class, private variables, right? So you cannot use read a and read b, right? Read dot a and read dot b. Isn't that the Okay, and ma'am, can you explain the uh, syntax in the com dot read dot read th that thing? This one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this we uh, qualify as a fully qualified name because see here this read could be a class which is there in multiple packages. Okay. So we want to specifically say that okay, I'm referring to this read class which is inside the com dot read dot package. Got it? No. So that is so why that I'm is a that is a class of, like type here, right? Like. Uh, in the com dot read uh, package, there is a read type. Correct. Correct. That? correct. Correct. Okay. There is a class class read capital start, and this is a folder name. This read is a folder name, and inside that you have a class read. Okay. 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 And you are going to instantiate that me the uh, method. Uh, sorry, uh, an object of that class. Okay. Got it. But you are trying to access here which one the read or dot a and read dot b which are private variables and this is private inside variables. a different package right so only within the class you have access to the private variables okay okay dot read values so read dot read values is not a problem this is not an error because read values is a public method no you can see public method whichever package it is it is not a problem right it can be accessed so read dot read values is not a problem that is the first one because of illegal access. There is no illegal access to read class because read class is very much a public class which is inside this package and we are uh, referring to it by its fully qualified name just com dot read dot read. So there is no illegal access to the read class also. Only the variables a and b have been declared as private and so you cannot directly use this. You have to use some access and methods to access these variables. What it now? Yes, ma'am, got it. Thank you. Ma'am, just uh, question number two. Just can you just once more explain the flow of the this how uh, this flow of this program because see, how so, this compared to X uh, means so see uh, preset is a class so if you go through the preset huh? class the preset is a uh, there is a there is something we call as a natural ordering of elements of this class right I mean a natural huh? ordering so huh? if if there is a comparator, so here as you can see, the set will actually check if there is a comparator for this class. So you you, you have actually implemented the comparable method here, right? So there is a comparable no, method here. My uh, specific doubt I will ask uh, then you can clarify. Yeah. Actually, my problem is I am not hmm. able to get out from this main because nowhere I hmm. find the connection where this uh, compared to is invoked. Where where it is invoking? So compare to is like this equals method and the the run method. Okay, that may be. No, no. Okay, From methods, where where I am invoking means where am I asking? Ki I I need to compare this. No, no, is, no that uh, is, a is it implicit? Yeah, is preset, it implicit. implicit. The, see, the tree set has a property of ordering, right? So I will just show you the documentation of tree set. Then maybe you will understand. Uh, tree set since it is uh, when I start inserting it start comparing and accordingly it will start arranging. Correct. It, it is a oh. by default invocation that is a, so I don't know if you can, can you see this tree set? You can see okay. this. Okay. See the comparator. The set is defined as a but a tree set instance. Uh, okay. All element comparisons using its compare to method. So two elements that are etc etc. But somewhere it is said that it will use the comparator which is provided or it will, okay, you have to check for that somewhere it is, see the elements are ordered using the natural ordering or by a comparator, comparator provided at set creation time. Oh, that what is the compared to method that we have specified. Yes, yes. Okay, just, just explain that compared to here. 
what it is in the natural is this is so, so here yeah, yeah so if the current object so for natural ordering you see the ascending ordering right the sorted order that is a natural ordering in that the expectation is that if the current object is less than the given object then it normally returns a minus one but here you are overriding it to say that you have to return plus one which means that the maximum value has to come on top you can assume that this is the higher one right this comes on top or something like like uh, once uh, uh, the comparison happens between every element right, right that's how the ordering happens no so in that ordering by default this will return a minus if the current object is less than the object which is coming in as parameter and you're overriding to say that i want the other ordering if this is less than this then you return a positive and then the comparative sorts is using the in the descending order okay yeah you can just go through quickly go through this tree set class and i think you will understand it better okay. Yeah, so that is um, question two. Question. Any other questions? No. Uh, one. <laughs> yeah, of course, you can choose not to answer. But yeah. would the would can we take mock two as a kind of a sample of how the no, paper no. would be? No, <laughs> I will not assure you that. <laughs> See, the topics are same definitely. Uh, all these things, but I I I cannot assure you that you know this will be the kind of. See, question. If you ask me, the level difficulty level, yes. Kind of questions, yes. But will this be the exact topics from which it will be asked? I'm not sure. It it could be any topic from uh, five. I mean one to eight, of course. With I, as you can see here, the I maximum priority is given to week five to eight, right? And few things might be like, uh, I mean, you still have to use concepts from week one to four. That's it. But generally, we'll be focusing on five to eight. But I cannot. I mean, I will not be able to assure you that this will be the topics, precise topics from which it will be asked. But this will definitely help you. If you work this out, at least a few questions you will be able to answer. Is my Understanding, yeah. I mean, I I'm not giving you an assurance even, and I don't even remember the. Yeah, the reason I ask is that except for question two, I got all of that right on Monday itself, so I was not sure whether I was over. Ah, yeah, but yeah, maybe a bit. Yeah, yeah. So don't don't go in with that kind of a confidence. Just to be a little uh, wary of you know there could be other kind of questions also. So just to brush up all. But the revision topics, whatever we have done it today, no, there won't be anything beyond that. That is for sure. Ma'am, so one just. Uh, not related to this thing. Uh, yeah. Last time, what happened in the exam? Actually, in this term, I took three three subject, mm -hmm. but uh, one I do not have any quiz because this is only the final term. So I incidentally I have two subject. Now mm -hmm. for the two subject, the total time is allotted two hours. Fine okay, for three okay. subject, three hours like that. Okay. But the problem is that in the portal, in the means um, examination portal, hmm. they do not have any timer. Even though they have timer, generally what happened? If I finish my time, they are just give me ten minutes alert. You have only ten minutes left. Okay. So I do not have that. So incidentally, I crossed the means two hours and I. Uh, extend a certain say ten minutes. Then I watch that it is over. Then I submit it. I don't know. Uh, this is I am just asking. Since I I am having two subject, and the allotted time is three hours, or I will still wait for that message. I don't know this part. Yeah, even I am not sure. I you will have to check with JK or Ops team. Okay, I am really not sure how these things work there. Because what I've been. I, I yeah. can. Can I? Can I mention? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah please, anybody else who uh, knows it? Yeah, so, please help. Yeah. Because uh, I have over that fifty, uh, so I get that extra minutes also. But so my timer is pretty high. Uh, unfortunately, you can't take a watch now, and uh, there is no clock also. So what I do is that uh, you know when the when it, the Thing starts. It says this is the time, right? Uh, elapsed time remaining. I write that in my first sheet, right? I keep that with me, uh, in a whatever rough sheet I have, and then I also write down very clearly in big letters that I should stop when this thing reaches that time. No, no. Here, here is the confusion. In 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 the admit card. I mean, in the uh, the card, they are showing that if you have two subject, allotted time is two hours. But when I start giving the examination. They are showing 180 minutes. I don't know. No, that's the that's why I'm saying. So, so I mean, let me let me just say. So what I say is, I see 180, right? So I say two o'clock. 180 was remaining, right? And I should stop when 60 minutes are remaining. Yeah. That is how I calculated. I write that number big time, and then whenever but it goes to that, I know that I have to exit. So that is that is a trick I use. 
most the problem is if you <coughs> when you are mid of this kind of problem you don't watch anything because you are fully involved and you don't know where this time get passed unless and some alarm or click is there Yes, so the instructor team will not be able to answer because I don't think the, yeah, they are exactly. so it has to be passed out to the passed out to the TCS ion, right? I mean, they, it's their software ultimately, right? So definitely, we can give it as a, a, a client requirement or whatever. So uh, please post it and uh, tag JK also specifically and say that it is very difficult to track time when you know there are uh, so many things happening and you are in a middle of confusion. But really, don't expect anything much sooner because uh, I mean, I'm not sure how. How much time this is generally takes into you know, bringing new features and all this? I have no idea about it. But at least if they can provide a clock inside the hall, I think that should be helpful for you, right? So yeah, some suggestions, uh, please. Uh, I'll also pass it to. I mean, convey it to JK and I'll, we will put it across. But yeah, I'm not sure when exactly you'll get a. a feedback. Um, yeah. This Puneet, uh, can I just add to that? Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. Ah, uh, Samit. I'm assuming that one of your exams is BDM. No, no. Or SC. One is NLF and another one is this Java. Okay, so if you if you have three subjects but only exam for two, you will still get three hours, and the system will not detect any irregularity. That okay. means I can use these three hours for these two subjects. Yes, people have done it. So unless there's an audit done, there's no way to check it. Number one, okay. That's why they put the code of uh, conduct on us to submit it ourselves. Okay. Second, now suppose that you have three subjects in an exam. You only give answers for one, and you are absent for the other two. You will still get three hours. Okay. Right. It's just that you can choose. This is because of the flexibility. It's you feel this way. All right. Okay. 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 That's one. Uh, now, uh, ma'am, can I ask some questions about Java? Two quick yeah, questions. Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. So, so this uh, compared to sort, apart from uh, sorted lists, is there anywhere else we can use it? Sorted arrays, sorted lists, tree maps. Apart from there, anywhere else? No, I did not understand. So come. As such, can you use the comparator method? Sorry, compare to method anywhere else? Is it by implementing yes. the comparable and overriding? Is that what you mean? That means can I make a class which is comparable and add it my own compare to? So when you implement the comparable, then it actually that's what you are doing, right? Effectively. Okay. So that becomes order. Okay. So if yes, I make my class extends comparator, so it becomes an ordered class immediately. Uh, yeah, but you yeah. need to store that in some sorted collection, no? like tree set or uh, any sorted thing that will implicitly. Okay. So okay. here, why it worked is because you are actually having the set, right? The tree set, which is uh, which, which is which also has ordered. this as the parameter. Right. Right. Yeah. Also right. 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 yeah. Okay, right. understood. Okay, second question is about try and catch. In yeah. the slide, it said that if the try has an exception mm -hmm. and Multiple catch statements match it. It will do all of them one after the other. No, no, no. And no, that's not what I said. So if there is so not you said in the slide yeah. it said it will match all. It will perform all matching catch statements. No, no, that's not okay. I don't think. Okay. Let me just uh, take the slide back. So it does not execute all. It only executes the first one which matches. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. And uh, if I want to enable or disable. Asserts. This is for assertions for hmm. multiple classes. Huh. Do I just put one single EA and then comma separate or space separated names? Space separated. Ma'am, that is not correct because I tried so, that; it doesn't work. For each class, you are supposed to give a dash EA, and the hmm. last class name is the name of the program it has to run. But in our quiz and in our discussions, yeah. We are taking the executable class also as included in the as a parameter. The last thing in the Java command is the program that you're running. That's correct. Yeah. Class, right. Program but, name. Correct. Right. But in our examples, when we were discussing in one of the sessions, there was da 
and name a one class and then main or f class so we assume that the same da will be applicable to both the classes Oh, okay. There is no space delimiter. There is no space delimiter for EA and DA. No, but have you tried one? It? Yes, ma'am. And I have when I put a separate EA for each one, then it works. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So my assume, my understanding was that the last one will be taken as a program name, and everything else will be taken as a parameter for the first minus EA. I didn't know that. Like we had to put a minus EA for each. That yeah, that's there. what. Yeah. So I was trying that, and I. After searching for it online, I figured out this is the solution. So the at the most you can do is a dot 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 or a package dot dot dot. Ah, correct. Or a class dot dot dot. Right. Yeah, that that dot dot dot. I think we had in one of the assignment questions, but the right. multiple classes. Uh, yes. So in one minus, of the assignments, it yeah, was minus there. EA, minus EA followed by class name. Minus DA followed by another class name. We have done it. But minus yes. EA for two classes, I thought we could put it with a space because the last one will be taken as a program name and the rest will be taken as minus EA is what I thought. But what you're saying is for every class that you need, you have to put a minus A class two, so. minus so, EA class two, minus EA class three. So right. Could you just right. confirm that? Because then some slide has to be updated then. Some one Which of the slide? questions or slides. Something I had come across during my revision. Okay. I had this example. Yeah. So maybe, right? Yeah. We just might have to go back and edit it. That's it from my side. So yeah, thank sure. you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Any other questions? Anything? Else? Okay. I think. Uh, yeah. So we have had nearly. Yes, ma'am. Three and a half hour sessions. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. Can I request that in the mock test? Your voice is not audible. Can you be a little louder? Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, better. Yeah. Hello. Yes, yes. I was asking that in the portal that the mock test for quiz two, the due test has already passed. Uh, yeah. Can you change that because I because for practicing purposes I was asking. No, then people won't be able to see the answer, no? no after checking, you can see the answer. I think. Sort of clicking the check button. Oh, do you want it as the practice assignment yeah, mode, yes, mode yes, not the like graded assignment mode, right? Yes, yes, like practice. Assignment. Oh, I thought it was in the practice assignment mode. It is not, is it? It is like that. Just let me check one second. I had uh, actually requested uh, it is in the practice assignment mode. Let me see what's showing that the due date passed and showing all the answers there. Okay. okay, it shows us fourth uh, July. But uh, yeah, okay. So with the check answers, okay, got it. Yeah, I get your point. Yeah, I'll inform you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And, yeah. Okay then, thanks everyone. So all the best. Have fun with Java Quiz Two. Okay. Yeah, and uh, give your feedback on the uh, this course just so that you know. Yeah, and we can try and improve wherever possible. Okay. No, I, 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 I've definitely been doing well. Thank you for that. And thank you particularly for the time now. I think it's been a marathon session. Thank you. Yeah, good yeah, session. Yeah, yeah. Good session. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, guys. Thank you all the best. Wish you all the best, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.